Okay, there we go. So we finally got the call sorted out. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, comprehensive review of the Netflix series Surviving Death. Uh, with me are Dr. Janice Minor Holden. Is it Minor or Mina? Janice Minor Holden, who's the current president of the International Association of Near Death Studies. Um, we have Autumn, Notes from Autumn, who's an atheist activist on YouTube. We have Nathan, who runs the YouTube channel Digital Gnosis, who is, um, I believe, your agnostic, or you describe yourself as ag agnostic. Sure. And we have um, Erin at the bottom there, who is uh, not on YouTube, but she does have a Twitter account, which she uses to um, share her experience of being an ex-Christian and deconverting from Christianity. So we, we effectively have two proponents of near-death experiences and various the various subjects covered in this Netflix series in me and Jan, and three skeptics to go um, to make everything fair. So what we're going to do is we're going to each read off our review for each episode of the Netflix series, um, starting with Jan's, then mine, uh, then Nathan, and then Erin's. Um, and Autumn is going to join in with the discussion after each review has been read to discuss um, the, the episode in more detail. So um, we'll start now with the first episode. If you haven't seen the, the series, I recommend um, going and watching it either before watching this back, if you're watching it on a, on a replay, uh, or go and watch it after so you get the context of what we're talking about. Um, I decided we're not going to show any part of the series just to be safe because I don't know really how the laws work and I don't know how to do it technologically. <laughs> so that's the main reason. <clears throat> so uh, we'll start with the first episode, just a, an overview of, of what it's about. This is um, covering the phenomena of near-death experiences. So that's Dr. Jan's speciality. Uh, if you'd like to go ahead with your review, Jan. limitations. And of course, the first limitation is that near-death experiences are very complex phenomena. Um, they uh, vary quite a bit from person to person, although they have some underlying universal uh, components. Uh, they're expressed differently by people depending on their culture, and then further uh, expressed differently uh, for each individual. So no two near-death experiences are exactly alike. So trying to cover a, com a um, phenomenon like this in one hour is a challenge. And um, furthermore, there are now like 40 years of research into near-death experiences. And you know, trying to cover that in an hour would be impossible. Um, and uh, and retain any entertainment value. So in terms of um, a, uh, an introduction to the phenomenon that hopefully would encourage viewers to go to sources to look uh, more thoroughly and critically at the phenomenon, um, would, uh, that would be ideal. Um, what I thought uh, was well represented, uh, the International Association for Near-Death Studies uh, Seattle group was um, well represented. Um, IANS has uh, local groups over 70, I think, around the world. And Seattle is one of those, one of the oldest ones. Uh, so um, it just shows how a meeting happens. Um, although, of course, we're doing them by Zoom now during these pandemic times. Um, and the one you, that they show there in the episode is in person. Um, they interviewed Bruce Grayson, who is the leading scholar of near-death experiences. He has the most refereed journal publications by far of any researcher, including more than me. And, um, and he is a, a very credible um, source for information on near-death experiences. He has actually a book coming out uh, very soon called After, in which he reflects on his um, 40 years of, ex of experience researching near-death experiences and how they have affected, how that process has affected him personally, which he's never spoken about in public before. Um, and 
Um, and they introduced the phenomenon, you know, I think, you know, reasonably well. Um, the title of the series is Surviving Death. And uh, indeed, people who have had near-death experiences, some of them, not all, have actually been in cardiac arrest um, and their near-death experience was associated with that um, episode of being uh, temporarily dead. But one of the things that we say in uh, the professional literature is that near-death experiences alone cannot provide evidence of the survival of consciousness after death. And that's because, again, from a purely scientific perspective, we're not communicating with people who have remained dead and were permanently, irreversibly, um, couldn't be resuscitated again dead. And for all we know, what people experience in the first moments of death and what they experience once they're permanently, irreversibly dead could be different. And so near-death experiences tell us um, reliably what some people, like 17% of people, experience during the first moments of death. And, and you know what I'm saying now when I'm citing statistics and things like that, that would have been helpful for them to include, to say, you know, first of all, a near-death experience is not the same thing as a near-death episode or, or a close brush with death. Of all the people who survive a close brush with death, upwards toward maybe 10 to 20 percent will come back reporting that they had a near-death experience associated with the near-death episode. And the experience is the, is the subjective sense of being conscious and usually per perceiving the material environment from outside the body or and or um, going to encountering uh, transmaterial environments and entities such as deceased loved ones. So um, so all we know is that up to 20% of people have this experience when they die. We don't know why 80% of people don't report anything unusual during identical kinds of circumstances. And, you know, all of this is um, more nuanced information about near-death experiences that, that they really couldn't present in an hour trying to introduce the topic. So for what they were trying to do, make an hour introducing the topic, make it entertaining. I thought it was fine. Um, I just, um, you know, have concerns about how um, people coming away from that episode thinking they know very much about near-death experiences. No, they don't. So that's it. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Jen. So I'll mm -hmm. now go for um, my review. I think I go a little bit more in depth onto the actual episode itself and what they focus on. So um, I'm just going to read it directly from my screen. So um, we start off with uh, Dr. Mary Neal's near-death experience in the episode. It's a decent example to give um, because Mary Neal is a certified um, well, practitioner of, of medicine. She's a orthopedic surgeon, I believe. So she is initially well versed to understand um, the medical science, having been brought up in that that environment. Um, so the important features of her account that are given are that she had fixed eyes and no oxygen for 30 minutes, which shows strongly that consciousness would not have been physiologically possible according to our current medical knowledge. Um, she also gives an example of an ambulance that was uh, coincidentally there uh, in a position where it seemed incredibly unlikely since it was in um, in the middle of some forest somewhere in Chile, I, I believe it's in or Chile, however you say it, in there. And, and she said, you know, well, this ambulance was, the chance of an ambulance being there was incredibly unlikely. But of course, we, we can't really say that it's not a coincidence because we need to know more information about what, what cities were nearby, what um, towns and why that ambulance was there in the first place. Uh, she also had a premonition of her son's death um, during the experience uh, while her son was still quite young. Um, the date of the death was not given by the spiritual beings who gave her the, um, the premonition, but she assumed that from the information they did give that it would be around his 18th birthday. Um, he did die later on. It was after his 18th birthday. I think he was 20 or so. So the date was slightly off, but there is still a relevant premonition there of the son's death as the spirits did not actually give 
a accurate date and that was one formulated by herself right now we move on to the notes about uh, bruce grayson it's great to give him some time on here because he gives a very decent introduction to the actual research done uh, although it is very lightly touched we start with very simple statistics on near-death experiences versus no experiences as jan said in hers about um was it 20 percent do and 80 percent don't although there's no reason as to given as to why this may or may, may not be the case because we don't know why um it's important to note that near-death experiences took place during prehistoric times as well as dr bruce grayson mentions which may suggest that the following uh, cultural aspects of the cultural aspects that followed that time such as um, religions and philosophies are not root psychological causes um, of these experiences although they can certainly shape the interpretations of them um, he also gives an example of someone falling off a cliff which also shows that these are not necessarily induced physiologically only and just the fear of um, about to be that you're about to be killed or that you're about to suffer some grievous injury is also a trigger for similar experiences or identical experiences in a lot of the case um, and we'd expect that should NDEs be physically physical phenomena alone, for instance, the dying brain or lack of oxygen, we would not expect this to occur unless our beliefs can drastically alter the structure and operations of our brains. Um, he then mentions some physical explanations that have been posed with only brief reasons as to why they are not sufficient, uh, although there is much more information from many studies that could maybe have been added here. Um, he then touches on an important point, which is anecdotal information. As he rightly states, all science must begin with anecdotes and the observation of a new phenomena, followed by the recognition of patterns to gener generate hypotheses, which must then be attempted to be for, uh, falsified. I'm, I'm going through really quickly because I've got a few notes here. I just want to give the main main points. Um, there are also many more, all of which are insuff there are also many more explanations, also of which are um, insufficient by themselves to explain the observations made. Uh, do, 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 do. That's not really relevant. Right. Uh, the Pam Reynolds case is given um, very briefly, but with a lot more detail missing. And I urge anybody that's interested in veridical perception during near-death experiences to study this case in its entirety um, and then compare the data that's, that comes from that case um, in, in comparison to physical explanations given. Dr. Gerald Verley is one of the most pro uh, prominent proponents of a physical explanation for this case, and his ideas are certainly worth considering. Right, we then move on to Dr. Peter Fenwick, who's a, no, a neuropsychiatry, which, uh, neuropsychiatrist, which effectively means he looks at how physical disease or damage to the nervous system and brain causes mental disorders. Uh, he clearly states that he did not believe in any of this uh, NDE nonsense outside of the fact that it was this only happens in California and places like that, which he mentions. Uh, he says, we are far too sensible over in the UK to believe such nonsense. That's how he, see, uh, how he saw things. But once he encountered uh, an experience uh, through a client, he then decided to study them. 40 years later, he's now convinced that there are, there are what we would call paranormal aspects. He is very well qualified to make such an opinion as a neuropsychiatrist. Um, he later says that he's frequently challenged that during cardiac arrest there is still a working brain, at least very slightly working. Again, as a very well-educated neuropsychiatrist, he states that we must have a very well-organised brain in order to maintain consciousness. Although we certainly uh, only know a very small amount of how the brain actually works, we do at least know the necessary correlates for consciousness to take place. The main one being high levels of cortical activity shown by an EEG. He states that once the heart stops, the brain does not organise itself to the level required. Um, and then that's effectively his part. I'll come back to that, right? Oh, no, sorry. The episode concludes with a, an experience of a premonition of death during childbirth. Although, uh, again, although there may be evidential value, I feel that the time would have been better spent on the actual studies of these instance, uh, instances, the statistical relevance of them, and the implications that they have on our current theories of consciousness. And I've just briefly added a section here. What would have been... Uh, what would have improved the evidential value of the episode? I've got three points here. Um, I feel strongly that Dr. Grayson should have taken the majority of the episode with more time allotted to the study of the phenomenon rather than with telling the experiences of the few presented. Uh, I think Mary Neal and Stephanie's experiences, Stephanie is the final premonition of death during childbirth, as well as the section in which personal accounts are shared, should have been either shortened or removed in favour of the researchers such as Pim Van Lommel, Penny, Penny Sartori, Sam Parnia and Geoffrey Long. Not including their research was a great opportunity missed and a lot of vital information on the field ignored. And finally, the single most important publication in my view of the, uh, of the ridicule phenomena 
um, The Self Does Not Die, written by Titus Rivers, Annie Durbin and Rudolf Smith, should have been outlined uh, and the authors contacted to discuss its relevance. The book contains more than 100 accounts of third-party verified veridical perception which took place in physiologically impossible conditions uh, due to our current understanding. If we trust the portrayal of them from the authors and the testimony of professionals and non-professional witnesses. Um, I gave the episode overall an evidential value of 5 out of 10 and an entertainment value of 8 out of 10. I know it's a lot, sorry, that's why I tried to read it quickly. Uh, over to you, Nathan. Let's unmute myself. Hello. Um, yeah, so I enjoyed uh, watching the series um, to start with, and I guess the the two episodes that stuck out for me, I think, I think the ND one um, and perhaps the reincarnation one were the most interesting to me. And I think the way it's presented, at least, is compelling um now do i think that it's necessarily um a good introduction to ndes um i don't know because i'm not an expert in the field so you know how how unbiased how representative can i really say it is i've just got kind of got my opinion here um i think from some of the research i've done it does seem like it's taking quite a one-sided approach to it um so a lot of the stories are presented alongside visuals, for example. And I think for the unaware viewer, someone, who, someone who's not familiar with these sort of things um, in the literature, that those visuals are going to be highly suggestive of some of the stories that are being told. And then there's further problems of perhaps the way that the stories are being edited and clipped together as well to um, sort of make out exactly what happened. So, so one example I can think of this is where someone's saying that during their experience that um, like geometric uh, spatial relations would be the wrong way to talk about it. Um, and, but the visuals show the camera kind of flying around a hospital room, which makes you think that they're, they're physically moving around in three dimensional space, which is completely contradicts what they're actually saying at the time. Um, so, so that would be a problem. So one of the first examples given is this Mary Neal person um, who is a doctor of some sort, I can't remember. But what, one of the things I do remember is something that you frequently see with conversion testimonies um, across all religions, which is this idea of, I was really skeptical beforehand um, and you know I, sh I should be really rational for X and Y reasons. So if it convinced me, it should convince you too. And um, Carol Zaleski also points out that this is common in medieval uh, near-death experience uh, literature as well. Um, it, I, th I think that this is like a, a bizarre human, human feature, but I think it's, it's more of a rhetorical thing, and I don't think it should be too convincing. Um, because, for example, like she doesn't highlight what her like philosophy of mind is. She reports... Oh, uh, I'm, I'm kind of stumbling over my words here. There's a few things we need to like pass out in terms of what's going on. So we've got like the phenomenology of the experience, right? And no one is saying that that didn't happen. Um, I certainly think that it's really interesting what's going on with the phenomenology, but there's a difference between phenomenology and explanation. And the explanation would be say what, what's really actually going on. And very rarely do we have an actual explanation offered of what's going on. There's just these vague notions that the phenomenology sort of refutes naturalism somehow um, without us saying, you know, whether we're actually committing to panpsychism or substance dualism, like what, what is actually being proposed as happening um, in the situation, you know, do we have to revise actually our entire conception of physics because we're violating uh, the conservation of energy laws in some sense for an interaction to go on here between memories and your, like the, the burden of proof gets shifted onto the materials in a way where I, I feel like it, like it shouldn't throw out the whole thing. Um, what, what were the other cases that went on it? The, oh yeah. The other, the other one that's mentioned of, of Pam Reynolds. And I think again, they, so they show the surgeon, for example, saying, Oh, we don't, I don't know how she um, could have known that it was like a toothbrush, for example, but what they, what they don't say is how, um, so the, the original interview of her was three years uh, by Michael Sabon, I think, who's a cardiologist was three years after the actual event. And um, there's no discussion given throughout the entire episode of like memory distortion, what role uh, memory recall might play in it in um, any of these, there's various um, videos of people in support groups and there's there's no talk of um, 
how kind of like peer pressure or expectation from the group might inform the way that people come over time to, to recall these experiences, to piece them together, to try and put them into a plausible um, and coherent story over time. So I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm being like, um, I, I know I'm jumping around a, a bunch of things here and not being particularly coherent, but I just think there was a lack of sort of critical thought about any of these things from the other side. The only time that anything critical was mentioned was when it could be like pr uh, briefly pushed aside. So for example, with um, Fenwick saying, well, it can't, it can't, you know, skeptics will say it's hypoxia. Well, it can't be that. And if you say that, you don't know anything about consciousness. Um, another claim to push it, like we don't, we don't know what the neural correlates of consciousness are. Um, I don't think Fenwick said that in the video, but that, that, like there is still a hard problem of consciousness in the sciences and philosophy. Um, we, we haven't fully explained consciousness um, for, from a materialist point of view. So to say that they're not present um, isn't, could, couldn't be completely accurate because we don't know what they are. Um, so I don't, I don't know that there's, that I've got much else, to, much else to say on that, but I just, I just wasn't convinced. I didn't find that they put forward um, the case from the opposing side, which I think would have, if, if it was to be like an unbiased, like what's going on in NDEs, they would have shown what they did show, but then I think also spent maybe 30% of the time with people who were kind of skeptical of this with um, neuroscientists um, and psychologists who have alternative explanations for what's going on and, and maybe get their takes on it, um, which they didn't seem to do, which was disappointing. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Nathan. Erin. Uh, Well, Nathan <laughs> covered a lot of the notes that I had because I had a lot of very similar feelings. Um, hang on one second here. <clears throat> okay. Um, I don't have a, a lot more to add to, to the questions. I, a lot of my questions were covered just now um, with Nathan. Um, the biggest thing about this episode for me was um, kind of what Nathan had mentioned that it was it did sort of feel like um one-sided because there was a lot of um most of the people talking had had believed their experience and they'd they'd had an, a personal experience and there was seemed to be like um kind of a projected um like shame put on people who don't believe it for whatever reason um that was one thing that kind of set out to me I did find the the whole episode like very entertaining and very interesting and part of um what I like I wouldn't push back on is like that. I, I agree that these people have had experiences and I think that in so in, in as much as it was beneficial for them, I'm glad that they had it. Um, I'm just not sure what that would imply for like, why, why is it important that everyone else also believes it? Um, I'm a little bit confused about that because there seems to be like this raging debate over whether we believe it or not. Um, and it seems to be mostly important to the people who have had the experiences. Um, and then I did have some like skeptical type questions that I, I that I had written down. Like I said, Nathan covered quite a few of them. The I looked up some stuff about and I, I I've looked up NDE stuff before. I find it really really interesting. Um, from what I can tell, that the components of an NDE are like change in thinking, change in feeling, paranormal feelings, and otherworldly features. And um, for me, I, I guess I still don't. I still don't feel convinced that any of those um, components of the NDE are necessarily um, external or like coming from the top down. I still I still see that there's a lot of um, explanation coming from like bottom up, um, but I am open to being convinced of, of it otherwise. Uh, but I just don't feel like that the episode provide me with kind of any kind of concrete evidence that that is true. Um, and then, I, I do have some questions about, you know, the memory and like the retrospective aspect of, of NDEs, like they are necessarily reported retrospectively and the what can happen in the mind and embellishments and that sort of thing. I find that that, that is something that kind of was on my mind throughout these, like when I was listening to the stories that um, I don't know how you would verify um, an experience, you know, right after the time of the um, episode versus what even happens a few days later and then onward with the story. I'm not sure. Um, I, I, I don't, I, I thought as far as rating the episode, I, I would give it like a good, like five out of 10 entertainment wise and, um, but conv convincing, I would say there's still quite a lot there to be um, wanted as far as information. And I would have liked a little bit more of, um, our 
people from both sides of the story explaining like what their different um, explanations are for these events as well. Uh, there was there seemed to be a bit of poisoning the well as far as like how skeptics are. Um, and they were brought up, but they were kind of immediately dismissed as well. So that that I mean. I understand that this whole series is um, trying to kind of convince people of one of one side, so that's fine. Um, but yeah, that, that's my kind of impression of that first episode. And um, oh, and Nathan had brought it up too that like coming from a religious background, I did see a lot of a lot of similarities with like conversion stories. Um, so obviously, like these are very compelling experiences that people have. Um, the need to kind of convince other people, uh, I don't quite understand what is the purpose behind that. Uh, if people have a great, like an experience that is life-changing for them, I think that's great. Um, so maybe the going forward with like, why, why is it important for other people to become convinced of their experiences if it's not something that happened to them personally? And that, that's all. Brilliant, thanks Erin. Uh, let me just see if I can fully remove that spotlight. Right, okay. Do, 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 put everything there. Right, so um, let's go over some of the points then that we all we all brought up. First thing I'll say is um, I agree that the cases that were given in the first episode were not very well um, were not very well evidenced. But then you'd expect that with a, a forty-five minute episode. I mean, with the Pam Reynolds case and the Mary Neal case, you know, there are so many more aspects to them which do provide. Uh, evidential value that there is something non-physical I wouldn't say paranormal I don't like that word but something non-physical um, taking place I also agree that there was a gross under um, under uh, there wasn't enough of a skeptical voice put into place I mean they could have brought on Gerald, Dr. Gerald Verley as I mentioned in my review they could have brought on um, uh, Susan Blackmore and various other people like that to give both sides but uh, as Aaron said I think the main point of this series was to kind of just push the idea that this is something worth considering and this is why it's worth considering to maybe bring it out more into the mainstream. Don't know, what do you think, Jen? Well, <clears throat> a couple things. Um, we, we all agree that 45 minutes just is not enough time to give this topic, you know, a fair consideration. Um, there is research about people's narratives and the extent to which they change over time. Uh, there's an actual study of near-death experiencers' narratives shortly after their near-death episode. And then I think it was like 20 years later, maybe 10 years later, can't remember. And they did um, uh, text analysis and found no significant difference. So these experiences, and, and people will say when they're talking about the experience like 10, 20 years later, that it's in my mind as if it happened yesterday. So there's something unique about the way these experiences are fixed in people's memories. But the main point is that this episode didn't didn't get into any of that, and and the because it treated <clears throat> so um, so topically um, and left questions for especially people who are you know, thinking really critically, um, it's just a, it's just a limitation of the episode. Um, to the question of uh, what difference does it make if someone um, has a conversion experience or what, what implications do NDEs have for the rest of humanity? Um, there's, uh, what people are saying who've had conversion experiences is um, that they perceived that how they looked at the world, which is how many people in Western culture look at the world, uh, was limited and to, and to that extent incorrect. And that they have something uh, like a broader perspective and they're trying to help other people not make the same sort of mistake that they made of um, drinking the Kool-Aid of Western materialist um, philosophy as the as the be all and end all of of phenomena. Um, so that's that's what the the purpose is, um, and that uh, many near death experiencers come back with the uh, conviction that our lives have purpose, that we're existing in this material world 
to advance spiritually and that uh, absolutely they are they know from experience that consciousness is not limited to the function of the brain and so but the but the real ultimate implication is about the importance of advancing in our capacity to love and acquiring knowledge and that if um if it were widely accepted that near-death experiences are what they appear to be then the message of them also takes on um, more um, weight and has the potential to influence culture in a positive way by influencing each of us in a positive way so but again the the, the bottom line for our purpose here is that none of this could be gotten into in 45 minutes mm. and so the um for what they for the time they had i thought you know they did fine introducing some ideas um and i will say too though that um the the possible reason that they didn't bring in the skeptical point of view is that uh, most people who have looked at all the evidence and really know the research literature well have concluded that NDEs are are what they appear. They're not just a, a subjective experience, but um, something um, legitimate. And so um, it would be, I, I wonder if it wouldn't be like if you're having a program about the earth to bring on the people who believe that the earth is flat. Um, you know, do you really want to, if you only have 45 minutes, do you want to spend your time listening to a perspective that is held by an, a, an extremely small minority of people and contradicts all the evidence? I'm, I'm not sure if you can really draw the comparison between the flat earthers and um, those that don't believe in NDEs, because certainly the consensus of, of mainstream science is that these don't take place, so it is actually the majority position. Although certainly, as you say, you know, the, this consensus relies on the fact that a lot of the mainstream scientists the vast majority of them has never even studied this you know never even looked to study right. this subject and the yeah. consensus of those that actually do the work and you know, do it fairly and objectively do come to that conclusion but i think because the majority of, of the planet um or at least the the scientific background of the planet do agree that this um is more a naturalistic or a physiological phenomena they should have maybe at least had a, a few skeptical okay. opinions on it that's I'll, what i think but... that point i do find it interesting that the, that throughout the series and then even on my own research um outside of the series like that there is seems to be a little bit of an underlying presupposition that if you looked at the evidence you would be convinced um and and so just no, personally no, coming from me like i've I, I don't think it was said in the series, but I've looked up some, I look, I did some further research on some of the people that were represented in the series. And I did hear that kind of rhetoric come up, rhetoric come up quite a bit. And I found that kind of interesting because like I, I spent a, quite a good chunk of my life, <laughs> a, a, a full probably year investigating this stuff. And, and I've, we talked about this before about some of my own experiences that I've, that I've had. And, and I still came away unconvinced after, yeah. after those. So um, I think that that is the only, that is the downfall of not having the skeptical voice is that you have the people who are believing and are completely convinced to the point where they would claim knowledge on it, speaking for the skeptics um, and making it, making it um, their point that if you, if you looked at the research, then you would be convinced. So it kind of, um, it does give a message that people who don't believe have not looked into it. Yeah, and I, I certainly know that that is not the case, but I, but I can say that most people who look at all the evidence come to this conclusion, but not all, absolutely mm. right. I mean, you certainly, you, you can't say that, you know, um, everybody, all these researchers say that if you don't, if you really look into this research, you certainly will believe because uh, Dr. Gerald Burley is a very, very, <laughs> a well-known critic of this and he has done his complete due diligence on looking at the Pam Reynolds case. Um, many people say he has a point but the majority of the researchers that have also studied this case say that he's misrepresenting the facts and mm -hmm. that's often the case for skeptical people like uh, Keith Augustine as well is, an, is a known one and other people like that because and I wish they'd have, they'd have would have brought in someone like Titus Rivers because he he wrote the book The Self Does Not Die and taking the Pam Reynolds case for example there was no mention of the fact that the researchers have been in and they've seen the medical records for that case 
They've spoken to the um, head surgeons and everybody involved, all who say the same thing. And the, um, I think, for example, Dr. Gerald Verley's assertion is that these experiences didn't take place while the brain was not working and it took place at this point rather than that point. But then on bringing up his, because this is what I do, I, I hear a, uh, an argument against something. So then I put that forward to other researchers that I know. Jan, you know this and I'm sorry. <laughs> but I put it to other researchers to get their opinion. And um, one of them came back with me and said, right, here's the specific medical record of the procedure of the Pam Reynolds case. This is not true. This is not true because this is the actual medical record. And I wish they'd have got into, as I say, I wish they'd have got Titus Rivers to explain how these anecdotes, which start certainly as anecdotal evidence, are taken and then investigated and confirmed by medical records and third party verification of events and things like that. But as we say, you know, with 45 minutes, I would have taken out a lot of the um, a lot of the group session things and the IANS things, although it's, it's important to represent IANS, but I would have taken a good chunk of that away because they're not evidential, they're only sharing stories, and I would have put these um, these points in instead. Yeah. This is yeah, I find that she... Oh, go oh. ahead, Autumn, you haven't spoken yet. <laughs> I know, I've been, I've been patiently waiting, but I know everybody has a lot of um, good things to say. I appreciate that about you, Darren, that you said you take the, skept the skeptics' questions and kind of go and ask for further research in those areas and that's kind of what I felt was missing from the show is like I feel like as far as evidential value goes the show it, it was very poor like each episode I would say um because if the evidence was so strong I don't think they would need to add in these um appeal to emotions like they're constantly talking negatively about the skeptical point of view. Um, one of the, in the, since we're talking about the first episode, one of the women who had a near death experience mentioned that she used to be an a angry atheist and now she has hope. So this is like an appeal to emotions. Then we have an appeal to authority. You know, this is a, a psychologist who is very well researched in this area and he thinks that um, the evidence is strong. Um, where did I have that written down? Yeah, so like there's a constant theme of the skeptic turned believer and the skeptic is either unsupportive or lacking hope. And then um, they have this additional like appeal to authority aspect with the psychiatrist, like, oh, he's a well-educated psychiatrist. And so this seems to be like an argument, uh, like as an appeal to authority. Um, and can I just quickly... my question for Jan, because um, she was talking about that study on the um, consistency of one's narrative when they have these near-death experiences is like going through my mind in this episode is, you know, because we know that memory is reconstructive, um, could these stories get more like cohesive over time, especially with like shared experiences? And um, my question about the study that you mentioned where it seems that their narrative was consistent over a long period of time is, well, long-term memory is repetition. So if I have a story that's really powerful to me and I repeat it to a lot of people in my life and to myself because it was a, a big influence on me, could that play a factor in the consistency of my narrative because we know that long-term memory is repetition? Yeah, and um, that's a good possibility. I was really responding to the question about whether when you hear somebody's narrative three years later, uh, it seems to discredit the narrative because the time has gone by and we didn't hear it initially. So the point being that people's narratives do seem to be consistent. And there's been plenty of research where, uh, including like Michael Sabom was already mentioned, where the hospital study was done and the person was interviewed shortly after regaining consciousness following uh, at, a near-death episode in which they lost consciousness, which was all what he was looking at. Um, so, uh, so I'm not, I'm not um, really arguing the uh, the point that you made. Just only the point that if you hear an an account three years later, it's likely to be true to the account that was um, told right after the the experience occurred. Mm. Okay. Just, just like that, when, when, you, when you say that these skeptics are um, very, shown very negatively, I'd say that they're not as such. It's their arguments which are just said that, it, that they don't work. 
because we, we, you know, um, we've studied them. I, w- I would say that they straw man skeptics and um, like, I think there is a power in um, kind of saying what the skeptic might bring up and then just dismissing it in a certain way. There's, like, I don't um, think that's what they're doing. They're, they're saying this is one of the arguments that's come forward and it doesn't work. I don't, I don't think that, I, that's not I agree with Autumn as as a as a fellow skeptic I do feel like they, they brought up the skeptic argument just enough to say well this is what they would say um but the, and then they just they would write it off and I think what Autumn is saying they're like there there is a, a rhetorical power to doing that like oh we brought up the skeptical point but we're not going to really go into it because that that's just so close-minded of them <laughs> what, what I heard was this is this is one of the there are it, it did say Bruce Grayson there are many um example or there are many physical arguments put forward here's a couple of them and this is why they don't work I don't, so I don't think me, but they didn't bring up any of the they questions didn't... that i would have asked they, they didn't yeah. bring up like good skepticism because i would have had much better questions and i would have liked to see the answer to those yeah, yeah. i i wrote down lots of, that, that they had we all actually agree on that yeah yeah do, there was yeah. a lot of like a skeptic would just say that i'm stupid that this is stupid and i'm like i would never say that as a skeptic i would never call these people stupid or irrational or delusional I, I i would come i would have come with questions and and more curiosity to it than that so that 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 in my mind was like autumn said like a straw man of what uh, a, a skeptic would say so let me just say that if anyone wants to really examine the um, neurophysiological arguments that have been put forward for near-death experience and and the ways that they are inadequate to explain everything that's been observed in near-death experiences, I would refer you to Bruce Grayson's chapter on explanatory models in the Handbook of Near-Death Experiences. Has anybody read that? Okay. Um, I have I've read some clips from it, but not the whole I haven't thing. read it, but I've I've watched um I've watched I, some I would, I would love for videos of his to read that chapter and then let's get back together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Be interesting. Yeah. But what 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 is the alternative explanation? Well, it's the, not there isn't the, really sorry, Jen, there isn't really a, a, a given explanation outside of all, all we're doing is we're showing that physical explanations that are put forward don't work we don't know exactly the mechanisms of how it works but we're saying that it's it none of the physical explanations work that's the main thing there's an experience beyond what we can explain so we shouldn't just jump on a promissory note that physicalism will be able to explain it because it has in the past so we're not i I don't know of any full theory that's been put forward to explain this because we don't know the mechanisms we're just saying that the current one isn't sufficient so it needs to be modified how, how can you say it's there is no natural explanation if there isn't an alternative explanation sufficient for the effect no no current physical explanation i don't say na- no if, current if, natural explanation physical na- na- if there is a natural ex- well, there w- if there is an explanation it will be natural because you know if something exists it exists as part of nature Nature. It's just a part of nature we don't understand yet, and none of the current um, models of nature are complete enough to to explain this this data. And Nathan, I, I did hear you refer to panentheism and substance dualism, and different near death researchers have, in some of their publications, um, offered those kinds of uh, models as alternatives. Um, but there isn't one alternative model that everybody agrees on. So, um, so it is addressed in in the literature, you know, here and there by different um, different researchers. But, but for you, for yourself, what is the alternative explanation you would be going with? Um, I, I, what I believe from near death ex- what i know from between studying near death experiences and my own experiences is that consciousness exceeds the capacity of the human brain and the normal sensory processes and the capacity to reason and and um, predict and and so forth so um, so how that happens i haven't committed to any philosophical mm-hmm. perspective um, just would that, this just be human animals, or would it be non-human animals as well? I don't know. I don't know. I, I all, don't... all we can all we can say from the data is, you know, we've never ex- we've never registered any kind of conscious experience from a rat because they can't ex- they can't tell us. But um, we have. Sorry, I'll be right with you. But um, we 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 only have testimony from humans. 
in my opinion, yeah. if it happens to humans, as we are just mammals, you know, and animals, it, it should be a factor in every every living creature. How we don't. Well, know. that's kind of, and I guess I'll bring this up again when we talk about the episode um, where people interact with the dead or like have ghost-like experiences, but because um, even in human accounts of those experiences, usually the ghosts or somebody from the after the being from the afterlife that appears to humans is other humans or sometimes a pet but it's usually something that is um some of uh, someone who's had a lot of meaning in their life and my question kind of would be if if consciousness is beyond um the physical like and it it doesn't just have to do with our brains why would we people not have these experiences with um wild animals like why would it be stuff that ha is meaningful in their personal life why wouldn't we have experiences of i don't know dead dinosaurs that died a long time ago why is it always something that they can derive meaning from in their own personal life um i'm not sure let me come back to that question but but the the idea of that this does occur with animals is uh, if you look at Rupert Sheldrake's research on uh, what he calls morphic fields and specifically his book, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home. And a video that I show in my transpersonal perspective in counseling course where they documented a, a dog who was responding to the owner's intention to come home. Um, and all other physical possible um, triggers uh, to the dog's behavior were eliminated. And so uh, it does appear that animals have um, this capacity as well for their consciousness to exceed what their brain senses and capacity to reason, whatever amount that dogs have, you know, is um, in place. Um, so to the question of why people have, it is true, and Sheldrake's research, in fact, on um, um, prediction of uh, who is calling on the phone shows that the if there is a love relationship between the people, the people are statistically significantly better at identifying who's, who is placing the call while the phone is ringing to be able to say, oh, that's John. And they pick up the phone and say, hi, John, and it's John. Um, that, uh, that, that happens more where there is a close relationship. He gets his best, um, statist best um, accuracy from mothers and daughters because he finds that women also are better at this than men. And, and not just he, but anybody in the, in the field of parapsychology. Women are better than men, and the phenomenon occurs better when there is a love relationship between, um, between the, the people. And so it does, um, it, it, it is hard to explain from a physical, um, you know, using a physical explanation why love would be, um, an important factor in in this phenomenon mm -hmm. functioning. Do they have people self-report like the um, amount of love that they feel towards the, the people I in the study? How, how would you qual I, quantify that? I, uh, um, they did have, uh, they did the study with people who knew each other, were related to each other and also strangers. So they could compare um, friends relatives and strangers and finding that the statistically significantly more accurate were between friends and relatives and the best um, accuracy was happened to be between mothers and daughters. Hmm. I, I really encourage you to um, look into Sheldrake's research. It's very hmm. interesting. Okay, should we move um, on? Yeah. How long are we going to go, Darren? Are we two hours? Or... Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. We were supposed to be going an hour, weren't we? But that's, that's all gone I on thought. this episode. But... <laughs> we got an hour in the first episode. Yeah, that's fine. So, well, yeah. well, I suppose if, if nobody's kind of um, limited with time, we'll just keep going and until we're all okay. done. 
Yeah, I have to go in an hour. Okay, so, so we'll yeah, to... I'm somewhat limited on time too. I can I can easily I can do another hour for okay, sure. sure. So, so we'll, we'll we... aim for another hour. Okay, so let, let's move on to episode uh, two, which is the first part on mediumship. Then, uh, Jan, would you like to begin with that? Yeah. So my uh, review of episodes two, three, and four, I could actually probably give them all together. And that is that uh, whether the topic is mediumship, communication with deceased loved ones, ghost hunting, and all those sorts of things, um, these three episodes, two, three, and four, I was profoundly disappointed in. There is good research on all of these phenomena, and they didn't even touch on it. So, um, so I, I just think that there is all kinds of stuff to criticize about the um, about the episodes. All they showed was uh, like in one episode, they showed the uh, library of the Society for Psychical Research just to show that all this research has been done. Who cares? What, what does the research say? That's the important thing and they don't tell us. They have Chris Rowe, who's a wonderful researcher. He and Evelyn Elsacer have just completed a really excellent study on after death communication among Europeans. It's on her website. And um, the results that is are available on her website. And they don't even, they don't even talk, they said they re referred to the study just in a, like a little sentence, but didn't say anything about what they found. And so, um, so I actually maybe will help to shorten this, um, <laughs> you know, getting four episodes into one hour of remaining discussion by saying, this is my critique of two, three, and four. Um, no matter what the topic was, there's good research out there. They didn't address it. They just showed anecdotes, not even cases. And um, that Kate, to me, the difference is something that's really been researched carefully, investigated carefully. And, um, and it's just, it was um, entertainment value, okay, but, um, but um, validity, research validity, um, convincing, nah. Okay, okay uh, I'll, I'll go next. I did have another page, but I suppose I'll just, limit it down uh, as well to save time so essentially I'd say exactly the same thing uh, if I go through just the points that I would have asked to Im to have been improved for this episode let me just uh, delete all this crap <laughs> I don't need uh, right so what would I do to improve the episode two on mediumship one well I put the same as Jan really experimental data instead of mediums who can only offer up their experiences um, I wish the the producers would have reached out to those who performed controlled experiments on the phenomena or who have been involved in them. A good example would be Julie Byshell from the Wimbred Institute who performed uh, triple and quadruple blind studies uh, on the phenomena and found statistically significant results. Um, or Suzanne Giesman who's been rigorously studied as a uh, evidential medium and has been shown to be extremely evidential, extremely accurate. Uh, I'd have liked to have seen the results from these experiments uh, shown on, on the episode as in terms of statistical significances, objective evidential value, etc. Um, I also wish they would have grouped everything together a bit more. They seem to be jumping back and forth between subjects. They started off with, um, I can't remember exactly, but it was like they started off with a, a medium giving a reading to somebody, Laurel in Jackson, who they, sh they had ample people to select from. I don't know why they chose her specifically with her flamboyance and clear entertainment. Um, they started off with her then they moved on to physical mediumship then they moved on to learning how to be a medium and they moved back to physical mediumship again and they just they could have all put it all into one thing and they certainly could have taken some some of it out to put in some of these statistical relevances and the actual studies done um as i've said here as well i would have excluded laurel in jackson's reading as there are certainly much better examples of evidential mediumship available um, a review of documented cases of veridical information received from a reading would have been much more productive than this over-the-top flamboyant session uh, for episode do, 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 do. for episode three, hang on, I've jumped between, sorry, I've jumped between episodes. Right, episode two, another point. Um, they should have removed the segment with uh, the spirit voices of the man and the young boy that came from I can't remember her name, Nicole. For anybody that hasn't seen it, essentially she had a spirit guide called 
I can't remember, but some Native American. Tommy, or oh, was that a different yeah, one? That was a different was one. That, some some Native, yeah. Native American <laughs> guide, and all she was doing is going, you know, welcome friends to this gathering. And then Tommy Boy, as you said, came along, and, and it was, oh, hello, I'm Tommy Boy, I'm from London, or whatever the hell the accent was. And I think, you know, that's just going to fuel ridicule because even I don't believe that at all they could have had someone much better you know who, who's been proven to be evidential through um, the Wimbridge Institute tests and things like that um, I put uh, last time or oh, less time dedicated to lectures or classes <laughs> which which there was a lot of them showing you how to train to be a medium you know uh, how to train yourself in a phenomena that hasn't actually been shown why we believe it exists <laughs> I'd have put less time into that and more time um, discussing the evidence of physical mediumship that they provided in terms of the old photographs and footage and claims and given a bit more time as to why that's studied and what the results of those studies are, not just here's the pictures, you should believe them because we do. And episode four, which was Signs from the Dead, uh, let me just bring this up. This was a little bit better um, in terms of the evidence that's available because really all we have available for this form of evidence is cases and how um, unlikely or likely they are and the coincidence level of them. So um, I would have liked to have seen some information from Bill Guggenheim who's effectively the research or the founding figure of after-death communication research. Uh, him and his ex-wife Judy wrote the book Hello from Heaven which outlines a lot of these um, a lot of these cases. Uh, I've said, given the nature of the phenomena, I think the episode gave a reasonable introduction to the field of ADC phenomena, after the communication phenomena, and the anecdotes given should spark a reasonable interest for those with minds open enough to consider the possibility. Um, we could have done with more statistics to show how many veridical after death communications have been reported and verified. So, for instance, those who have had a communication from somebody who died, who then told them about, um, that was an example of a wallet that was placed somewhere they would never have thought to look and then they go and find it you know that kind of case i'd like to see more more research done on that and what it means statistically um for the evidence i've put for episode two the first on mediumship uh, evidential value i've put down at two out of ten because they missed a huge opportunity with that entertainment value seven out of ten because people will find it interesting they could have removed some of the stupid cheap jump scares and theoret uh, you know theoretical crap that they put on there or theatrical crap rather that they put on there uh, episode three, I've put, which is the second mediumship, I put evidential value as four, and entertainment value again as seven. Again, they could have done so much more, but they didn't. I think they were trying mainly to kind of entertain people with that one. And Silence from the Dead, I put uh, evidential value of eight, and entertainment value as nine. As I put it as uh, eight, because a lot of the cases that they did give, um, despite not having uh, examples of veridical um, cases, they did show some, uh, a lot of cases that did seem to be very coincidental beyond the realm of you know reasonably sane coincidence in terms of the levels of coincidence everything that matched up and the um synchronicities involved that would get people to think so that's that's my review of that those three episodes uh nathan yeah um so for those three episodes i guess i'll, I'll keep it pretty short but um i I think this was the one. So, so in the first one, I was thinking, okay, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with the um, sort of confusing explanations that have been offered. Um, aside from we just don't know, um, but nothing particularly weird's going on. Um, but I thought, well, maybe with the NDEs, there's actually some positive um, life effects. And I constantly had this like um, ethical dilemma where people seem to be getting um, positive. Kind of like um, outcomes from from believing in NDEs or finding support groups and things. Could, uh, uh, and um, so I was like, do do I really want to, um, you know, like would I want to disavow someone of of this belief if they'd formed it and, it and it was helpful? But with some of these episodes, I found, um, frankly, the the people in them to be very immoral, where they were prying on the vulnerable to extract their money, like the guy, the um. Or there are a lot of people who either had like a parent who is dead or a child who is dead or something like that. And then they were trying to like go to, to see a medium to get in touch with the other world to find some comfort. Um, and I found in a few places, these people were like exploitative or they'd like, like people would be skeptical and they'd like gaslight them and stuff <laughs> for that. Um, and then there were all these sort of aphorisms of in-group language that people were pressured to accept, like um, trust in the spirit world and stuff that they clearly didn't accept at the start. And then were pressured over time to accept. And um, 
I just thought this this was frankly bizarre way of making a living but probably funner than having a real job to be fairly rude about it um and yeah i, I just see these people I, I thought i thought it was really morally questionable what they were doing um i didn't find any of the kind of like apparitions and things um particularly convincing and i i think i found it even less convincing that it's like well it can only happen um you know, under under these specific conditions where, you know, you're not going to see any trickery that's going on behind the scenes or anything like that as well. Um, the signs from the dead one, again, again, was interesting because it's like, you see these people who basically I think are suffering from grief and it's the same way I'd sort of account for the resurrection appearances of, of Jesus where people are kind of experiencing pareidolia. Um, you know, they're like, um, if, if you're out there, Bernie, send me a sign. And then like a bird comes and gets a seed or something. And then they're like, it's him, it's him. And they're just kind of reading um, stuff in, they're finding patterns in a situation that, that, that isn't really there and focusing on the hits and ignoring the misses, which is something really consistent across the board with all these episodes. It's like, you know, I always see 11.11 on the clock. I've got, actually, I always take pictures when I see 11.11 on my clock and my Google Photos is filled with various pictures of 11.11 because every time I look at the clock, I just forget about the times when it isn't 11.11 and remember the times when it is. And I think that this um, this phenomena of confirmation bias is really consistent with these where people say, you know, if you're if you're there, do do this or that. And then when it doesn't happen, they ignore it. But when it does happen, um, you know, it's even however tentatively it, it does, it's like, well, well, this is clear, clear proof that something's going on. So overall, not very convinced and also sort of, um, I don't know, I, I, just questioning the the ethics of some of the people involved in in especially the kind of like financial exploitation there. Okay, brilliant. Uh, I'll definitely pick up on a few of that, but uh, Erin? <laughs> okay, so I I, um, I, also kind of lumped a few episodes together. I, I For episode two and three, the mediumship episodes, I really, um, I found them very bizarre <laughs> and very kind of uncompelling in a lot of ways. I, I did touch on that same idea as Nathan that I felt like I felt uh, kind of disturbed in a lot of ways that there is no safe net, safety net for people to not be exploited in this. Um, I did enjoy where they were teaching them how to do it themselves. I thought that that was a kind of a, a, a neat way for people to kind of control their own narrative as far as their grief process goes. I think that if you're going to um, go down that line to teach people to, you know, do it themselves was actually kind of a, a cool way of handling it. Um, some of the things that I found to be really, like, really questionable, same as Nathan had mentioned, was the parameters around some of the um, events, like the being in the dark, the dark and having to um, have the music playing and all, and that those things, I mean, they just, no they, they, allowed. yeah, that sounds, that seemed really weird for me. I've watched a lot of mediumship, uh, videos. I've, I've seen more compelling ones, um, on TLC. <laughs> um, yeah. so that, that was kind of strange for me, like the, the stuff about the ectoplasm and like the videos or the pictures that were all set, you know, in the early 1920s and that sort of thing, like, I, I, I just, I didn't find that episode all that compelling, but very entertaining because um, I think they did pick a very, like a flamboyant medium to have on. And, but if, if their goal was to try to convince people, I don't think they did a very good job with that. Um, I, I think that there was a lot of questions that came up as far as like a better explanations for what was going on, including like, um, like the preparation that goes into these things that, the, the idea of like kind of anchoring people in their in their experience that they were about to have by the preparation going into it um I also felt like there was kind of again an, an undue element of like shame or um you know like putting the blame on the person for being too skeptical and I felt like that 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 was also kind of touched on that line of un unethical because I do see these people as being very very good overwhelmed with grief and so um it's a really inconsistent way I felt that they would go about um learning to cope with their grief so if it was a if it was something that happened for sure every time then I'd be I would be on board with people doing this to as a mechanism for coping with grief um but it seemed to be fairly inconsistent the um the messages that they would get and um another thing that kind of 
came up throughout the whole series for me was that the inconsistency on the message coming in through the other side, um, like with a um, mediumship and like both both the physical and the mental mediumship, it seemed to always be a positive message coming from the other side. But when it came to um, NDEs, there were there were like um, I can't remember, Janice, you could probably help me with this, but the, the negative experience that people will, you know, they're, they'll say that they went to hell. It was very terrifying. And then later on in the series, they talk about crisis operations. And so um, the overall message getting that people are getting, um, it seems to be very positive, always uh, affirming and validating when it comes from a medium. Um, but then with NDEs and other ones, there's like, so the overall message um, is it a good one that like, you know, the afterlife is a good and peaceful place um, with the reincarnation, it seems like they're um, the people coming back like they why why would they come back if you know the afterlife is this joyful peaceful all embracing loving place. Um, and then episode four I actually put on a completely different level <laughs> than the rest of them I actually loved episode four I loved it I, I would give it like a 10 out of 10 for you know an entertainment value I thought it was really really compelling listening to the people um, who have like lost somebody and then as, as they're being kind of coached through this grief grief process um, and you know if if looking for synchronicities and um, those kind of thing as far as a grief and because it's on them and how they interpret it, I felt like that that was a, a touching episode. Um, as far as compelling with the, you know, the stories that went on, like I don't think it would be personally compelling for me, but I would never push back on somebody who's had a loss of a child or something, and they've they've seen um, they they've found hope in the butterflies or the birds or whatever. I think that, that that's that's fine, and especially if they're not having to rely on going through a medium or you know, a third party, then I feel like the ethic, ethically it's a lot better. Um, yeah, so, so the, I felt like the, those last few episodes didn't fit into all one clump for me. There was the mediumship. I didn't, I didn't appreciate the, the way it was put forward. Episode four with the paranormal or the bereavement kind of thing that, that I, I did like. And then if we're going to the episode five and six, um, I we'll, found we'll the paranormal and we'll do that. Oh, okay. We're not going to go there yet. Yeah. So okay. We'll do that. So that's, that's my episode two, three and four. Sure. Uh, okay. So we're going to go back to the open discussion now. I'd like to start off, uh, Nathan, I think your review of, uh, episode two and three, although reasonable was, was unfair. Uh, and the reason is I think we've discovered a, 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 a very, a substantial difference in the way I think and the way you think, because you initially go in and say, um, you're disgusted about the moral implications of these people reading, giving mediumship reads to, the, to those others. And I would say, yeah, I agree. But we can't say that because we don't know if if, the, if they, they are genuine mediumship or not, because the episodes didn't give us the evidence to show one way or the other. So what you've done is you've gone in with a presupposition that these mediums must be charlatans and therefore are immoral. Whereas I would say you can't say that because we've got no evidence either way to show whether they are or are not. I'd agree with you with... Um, the likes of Laurel Lynn Jackson and Mrs. Tommy Boyle, the, the most likely explanation for those is that they are frauds or they're just self-deluding themselves. And I would agree with that, but I wouldn't say that that's definitely the case because I don't know these people. I don't know the, any research done on them. If there's been no research done on them, I would conclude, yes, they're not genuine mediums, but um, you know, we can't immediately say that they're immoral for simply doing this because we don't know if they are genuine or not because we weren't given the information about it. If, if you found out I um, was running a commune and I said I had a divine revelation from God that gave me authority over everyone in my commune, um, and you said that's actually immoral exploitation, I said no, I've got divine authority that. from God. To do this. I wouldn't do that. I'd ask you for evidence. Wouldn't to say show it was me. immoral. I'd ask you for evidence to show me of this divine revelation. Okay. Which any okay, fair, fair, fair enough. Would, I, I would. Would you? Well, I, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. I would definitely, if well, pe I mean, if I saw people being then? exploited, because you're there. But well, you're, yeah, we're at we are at an impasse. Yeah, but because you because then you're not asking for evidence. That's not you know you're presupposing that it must not be true. Whereas I'm asking, well, show or, me. Well, because I think, I think the moral um, impetus there, if if I see someone being exploited in slavery, would precede the demand for evidence that there's divine um, interaction. But then if, if we that's, that's I think the. But then if he can provide evidence that this is actually divine from God, then what he's doing is perfectly moral because it's correct. 
It's only immoral if he's Well, I don't think it. it would make it moral. <laughs> I don't think God's command would make it moral in that case. It would just mean that he's, you know, got more power well, on okay, his side. Okay, it'd make it honest then. Yeah, that's right. It, yeah. would, it wouldn't make it. It wouldn't make it factually false. Yeah, um, I mean, then what, what goes into what what's immoral and what's moral is a whole other thing that I stick the hell away from because I've never the philosophy of that is ridiculous, and I, I've never tried to get involved with that. You want to say something, Jen? Yeah, just that um, I I thought the same similar to you, Darren, when I was listening to your uh, commentary, Nathan. That the fact that you could come away from those episodes with the concerns that you do just makes the point that they did a poor job of uh, of presenting yeah. the the research that actually has been done on mediumship mm. and uh, there are some mediums who have been researched out the wazoo and they're they are very accurate with specific information all these blinds you know mm. to make sure mm. there isn't cheating and so forth but none of that was presented no. and so people with the concerns that you have are free to come away having those concerns maintained or even increased because it was the topic was so poorly addressed yeah. and i would say i, I don't but don't you think don't you think it is important to show that people can use these claims to exploit people because um somebody who might be vulnerable like grieving should probably take into account that they're in that state and that there are going to be scammers that take advantage of the vulnerable i i think that yeah. i think that this show bringing up like showing the negative impact that this could have like um for to be specific um they they showed the medium that had all of this very accurate information about people and then they went to go look to see if that information was actually available about the families yes. on Facebook and online. Right. And it turns out that everything that the medium had mentioned I know. Was, exactly, exactly. Um, I'm just, exactly we, I'm just we're making. That's the point. We have yeah. evidence that that was the case. In this episode, we're given no evidence one way or the other. So we can't assume that they must be charlatans. They may be. And right. I, I agree with Nathan that they probably point, are. Without being interrupted, my only point is that I think it's good to show that on the show because to Nathan's point, it is possible that people could be taken advantage of, especially when grieving a child or a family member. Yeah, that was my concern too, was that there's that what is the safety net here for people who are in that situation and vulnerable? Because there is there isn't a lot of information about like how do you tell if somebody is an honest medium or a dishonest medium or um just somebody who is a charlatan and who just wants to make a buck it seems to be that there is no um for the common lay person that there there's no um there's no scale to prevent exploitation that's a that's i we, mm -hmm. we're all on mm -hmm. the same page mm -hmm. yeah I agree with that completely but would you what would you say the kind of like base rates are of genuine mediums to charlatans who are exploiting people if you agree I, they exist i don't i don't know i don't know do you have like an intuition do you think the majority no, of legitimate and, mediums I'll, um i i don't have a, an intuition but but i will say that even people who are have a very high accuracy rate also still make mistakes and and they talk about having good and bad days and and research confirms that they have relatively better and relatively worse days so uh so the whole thing is um is not as neat and predictable as we would like it to be um yeah, i have a like question that. sorry um but like the uh, for as far as cost um risk benefit ratios like do you think it's it is more beneficial or like just as beneficial or less beneficial for somebody to go through like a traditional grief counseling um because the the the, the risk of exploitation is lower um or is it like is it worth the risk of being exploited um going through this kind of a way of, of processing grief does that well, make sense? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. And and my I have a couple of responses. I don't know that it's an either or thing. I think that um, that visiting a medium. I know that visiting a medium uh, has been helpful to some people that I know. 
and um, and that didn't change that it was also helpful for them to go through grief counseling. However, I'll also say that I just completed a study myself, um, a randomized controlled uh, trial of um, grieving people who experienced uh, two sessions of traditional grief counseling versus uh, two sessions of induced after death communication. I don't like the word induced. That's, that's I didn't name it. Well, that's the name of the therapy, um, yeah. I'd rather call it facilitated after death communication. And the people completed standardized assessments of their grief before the first session and after the second session. And those who went through induced after death communication improved in their grief statistically significantly with a large effect. If you know anything about statistics, this is pretty unheard of in random, randomized controlled studies. Mm -hmm. and, um, and on two of the six aspects of the grief scale, they, they made significant uh, improve, the IADC clients made significant improvement with a moderate and small effect respectively. So, um, so I know from, for a fact that people benefit more, people who are open to either kind of approach because in order to be in the study, they had to be willing to be assigned to either group, um, do better in induced after death communication than they do in um, regular grief therapy. So uh, that study is about to be uh, published in the in Grief Matters, the Australian Journal of Death and Dying. So, um, so it is absolutely not exploitive to uh, to use an approach that involves after death communication when people genuinely benefit from it more than regular grief therapy. If I might. I mean, this is something that I was uh, kind of wrestling with. I was thinking about this before you, um, like when I was actually watching the show on my own. And I, I, so I, my opinion is, is that this life is all that there is. That's just where I'm at as a person. That's just my personal opinion. Um, and I was thinking about because observing mediumship as a person who has that opinion, I, I was thinking about this just as a coping mechanism and, and the ethics of that. And I, like, I basically, I basically wondered if the, if the outcome is positive for people, if it could be a good thing, even if it's not true. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I was kind of wrestling back and forth because I wouldn't want people to be taken advantage of um, if they were being lied to for money. Um, and, but at the same time, if something is helpful, um, does it matter if it's true or not? You know? Yeah. So, it, um, mm -hmm. yeah, go it's, ahead. A, it's a really good point. And one of the things that we say is that uh, one doesn't need to believe in survival of consciousness after death to participate in this um, approach. And um, the, the thing is though, that um, we also found, and another researcher, Michelle Knight at the University of Sydney, found that um, among people who've experienced after death communication, if they had already believed in the survival of consciousness after death, the experience just, you know, confirmed what they already believed. But if they didn't believe in the survival of consciousness after death, almost to a person, they believed in it after after death communication. So it, uh, in one way, it doesn't matter what you believe, but in the in another way, experience is very convincing for people. Can I can I ask a follow up question to this? Like, as far as beneficial. Um for the person who goes through this like does regardless of where they were before afterwards and becoming convinced of it like it's one of the kind of um 
underlying themes that I found throughout this series was it seemed like it added a new strain to their life because it seemed like they they now had this mission to convince other people of it and it was very dependent on other people becoming convinced as well for them to um like their their uh level of like peace I guess that they would get also seem to be dependent on whether they could convince others of it um does it yeah, and that wouldn't be brought up if you never went down that 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 you know trail of looking into these like life after death kind of questions um is that kind of something that you see too that like now they have this new kind of tension that they have to bring to their other interpersonal relationships no uh it does often it it can affect interpersonal relationships if someone who's had an experience like this is in a relationship with someone who is adamantly disbelieving in it that can create tension but um my i have not observed that people who've had these experiences and come to a new uh, cosmology um, feel compelled to convince others um, more people are kind of like me um, i see people in three groups at least in in this context there are people who've had experiences and no amount of armchair philosophizing about it is going to change what they know to be true so they're they're in one category and the um, other extreme are people who are adamantly opposed and no amount of evidence is going to um, change their minds and in the middle are people who are may or may not have had some experiences, um, but they're open to looking at the evidence. And um, and uh, what I see most people uh, manifesting is the a an increasing discernment that if they're talking with somebody in this category they just don't even try because they know it's not going to work and it doesn't matter and someday they'll know. And, um, and if they're with others who have had similar experiences, they talk about feeling a connectedness and kinship with them that they don't feel with the other two groups. If they're talking with somebody in the second group, they're happy to relate what they've experienced, what they know, and if the person believes it fine and if they don't fine um i don't i mean not that there aren't people who proselytize and and want to convince others but i don't see that at all to be in any way the majority like i would i think i see when you use the word proselytize like like it is it is hard in a lot of ways coming from somebody who was formerly religious to see how many parallels there were um mm -hmm. to somebody um in a faith tradition uh, and looking at everyone else as being um, outside of that. And I, I do find it interesting the what like, what do you think the significance of the language used um, often? And I see, I've heard you say it too, of kind of using to, using the words I know um, and like and a lot throughout the episodes it was like we're going to move you from belief um, to knowing. And I, I like that's something that I I see it reflected in a lot of faith traditions as well too like that that you need to kind of get to this place of knowing it um and then that will change your paradigm uh, so do you have any comments about that um like why is it important to move from that like i'm convinced i believe to i i'm going to state now like i know well i just i just subjectively feel a difference between what i believe strongly and what I know. There's like a subjective difference. Mm -hmm. And, you know, belief is based on like projection of um, to the best of my knowledge. And knowledge is holistic. And it's, um, it just, it's just there. Yeah. So. so that was just kind of an interesting one for, for I think, us come like the on, on the other side coming from it like the epistemology there of like um like i have no problem with people who who are that believe something but it's it's, it's it it changes things a little bit more when the language like it does kind of seem a little bit like insider language of like i know <laughs> um, yeah it's it's really hard to deal to um um 
I don't know what what verb to use deal with the the fact that when most people have these experiences they come to a place of knowing and um, and they will readily say that before they had the experience they had you know this belief system and that they now know was incomplete and so it's it's hard to um address that without sounding kind of like elitist or something like that but um but the the best um advice that i think people give in situations like that is to is to seek out the experience oneself and and see see what happens so for, for oneself I, I, I can relate to that. Like I've, I have spent time um, seeking after these experiences. And I, I'd mentioned when we had talked before, like that I have had some of the experiences that were talked about in these, uh, in these episodes. So I found it very interesting, but I, I still found myself on the side of not thinking that anything was happening externally um, yes. or, you know, some, a top down approach. Like I, I still, um, I think that they, like the life-changing experiences and I've, ta I've talked to people who've had um you know psychedelic experiences and i know that those were mentioned a little bit as well in the series so there's a lot of parallels there um i i but i didn't personally move from you yeah. know be belief in an altered state of consciousness being anything um external to to yeah. what yeah 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 and and i think that does happen sometimes it's i think you're you're probably do i without knowing the nature of the experiences you've had you might be in a minority but um but that does happen that people have experiences and um and um and feel confident that they can explain them in terms of in terms that then doesn't call for a shift in their cosmology it it's funny too sorry i'll stop talking in a second but like when have, i when i quick so we're running out yeah time. when i went through this that experience i actually went from being um a theist to becoming a, an atheist after my experiences i just feel like i, I mm -hmm. so it's really bizarre for me um hearing hearing that i'm i'm not um what usually happens okay i'm done yeah. There, there is a, a question there is a question for jan which i think is important before we go on um kim asks uh, has there ever been one case of veridical perception that has ever been confirmed under controlled conditions in sign in a scientific experiment no and uh, not under the conditions of a scientific experiment but under controlled conditions of like being in surgery and um, those sorts of things yes so um, I, I would just underscore what Darren has said a couple of times. If you are interested in this particular phenomenon, um, read the book, The Self Does Not Die by Titus Rivas, Annie Durbin, and Rudolf Smith. Um, it is a compilation of over a hundred cases of verified paranormal phenomena associated with near-death experiences and verified by credible third parties. And, um, and it addresses issues that even like Nathan has brought up, uh, the file drawer effect, uh, looking at the affirmative cases and just brushing away the, the, um, those that uh, don't fit the, um, if the, those that involve inaccuracy. And I actually did a study where I scraped the complete literature of every account that I could find, including studies in which they were purposely looking for veridical perception. So they would have, um, and in fact, in one case did report a case of inaccurate perception. And um, the um, it would have involved, it would have required thousands of cases with inaccuracy not to have been um, reported to make the findings statistically non-significant. So, um, so uh, anyway, in this book that 
that issue of uh, file drawer file drawer effect confirmation bias and all of that is discussed and um, and it um, that's so that's the that's the source that I would really recommend for people great and uh, Nathan again I'm sorry I'm gonna go for you here but not in any disrespectful way um, I think when, when you were talking about as we were talking about confirmation bias you were saying about the, the signs of the bird um, I think yes. you very grossly misrepresented that one because you said um, pe people see what they want to see if they're desperately asking for uh, someone to, for someone to send them a sign and a bird and they show a bird come down and eat some seed but that's not what happened is it in the in the episode it was a um, I can't remember everything that happened exactly well, that was but quite I, a significant I, I remember, thing yeah. what happened was is there was a um, the, a lady's mother died and before she died she said could you send me a red cardinal and where this woman lives I think it was in California or Florida one of those uh, not too good with ge US geography um, he said there's no red cardinals in where, where she lives and she asked the mum to send a red cardinal and in the day after the service um, it wasn't just that a red cardinal came down and, and landed nearby and ate some seed or whatever this red cardinal came down flew into her hands and didn't move and this was a, a wild bird I don't know about cardinals we don't have them over here but I don't think that's standard wild bird behavior and it came no. down and it, and it flew into her hands and it wouldn't move and when they went to let it out this cardinal was in her hand like that and he was you know saying get out of my hand like that and it, it flew off and then came back and landed straight on her shoulder again and wouldn't leave her and then eventually it did go off but it was very reluctant to do so so that i don't think you can contribute that to confirmation bias because that is a really unusual occurrence and this is what i, I say when i say that this is about as evidential as you're going to get outside of veridical ADCs with after death communication because this is you know there's so many levels of a coincidence for you to say it's a coincidence that I think it's beyond reason to say that it could be it could be a very 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 deep unlikely set of synchronicities that result in a coincidence but that kind of thing is very unusual and uh, the timing as well the fact that it was just after whatever and there's no button there's very 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 few cardinals if any at all in the state where she is to me that seems beyond coincidental. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, may, I, I think maybe if something like that happened to me, um, it might make me believe something. But when I'm dealing with someone else's testimony, um, yeah, but you're not. You've got the footage yeah, of it. it doesn't. There's footage of it. Yeah, no, I, I, I've seen um, the footage. It was that in the documentary, yeah. right? That was the the bird that she was trying to flick away. Yeah. It, it doesn't move me. Um, it doesn't move me to so, modify my beliefs so what's the what's the difference between something like that happening to you because i've had something very similar happen to me recently i'll tell you about yep. that as well but um what, what's the difference between having an experience yourself versus seeing on footage this bird acting in a very peculiar way to somebody else i think the difference is um i don't think that we form our beliefs um rationally and if it happened to me um, the irrational, like motivating factors of like um, having grief involved and stuff like that would push me over the edge to like form a new belief that there was something going on. So, so you think that this woman's being irrational? That this, yes. This bird, right? Okay. Fair enough. Well, I mainly have fit footage of the bird. To be fair, like we don't have any documentation of her asking the mom to send the bird. She, in retrospect, could have said, "I asked for this." Like something weird can happen to you the day after someone dies and then you can like um what's that called uh is it the barnum effect where you kind of when you're given vague information you kind of fill in the gaps with personal specifics so that, it could yeah. be a situation i'm not saying that that is what's happening i'm just saying there are there are always alternative explanations there to are. like anecdotal evidence yeah although to me that seems very clutching at straws but okay. well, why, why is that? I don't understand why that is like a worse explanation than like this whole other like thing exists in reality that we now have to commit to our ontology and believe in and like ghosts and mediums. And, like to, like that, that's basically the difference is I'm saying like all those natural coincidences for me are a better explanation than like mediumship is real, ghosts exist and um, consciousness is like this great universal one. Because, and that, because, that really is the the difference because there's all these different experiences as well that take place as well as this that suggest it right but i but that but that's the difference is you're you're saying it's really unlikely and i agree like it's improbable um but that's then i i just say yeah it's it's improbable but then 
you, you just take the other route and add all these things in, which, yeah, you know, well, like I'm... you can phrase it and say, but that's really silly explanation to go with, you know, but it's like, well, mm -hmm. saying it's really improbable, you know, that's really silly because it's really improbable or that's really silly because, you know, you like ghosts, mediums, like, and that, that's basically where we hit the impasse, I think. Oh. Yeah, and it, it has more to do with the way that you're framing things with your language. Like, and the show did that too. It, a lot of this seems like framing to me rather than like comparative evidence. Like, oh, well, I like this explanation better and that one is silly. That's what I'm hearing. Right, but, but, but I'm showing you that the footage. And right, you're, you're, and I'm saying there's an alternative explanation yeah, to which is, which is how possible. the footage... Which is possible, okay. but with all the other phenomena you know terminal lucidity and um, near-death veridical perceptions uh, other forms of after-death communication yeah. and other things i think the most probable explanation is that there is something to all this and plus the levels of coincidence that's needed in terms of synchronicity for that to be the case um yeah. otherwise you're just appealing to the fact that the lady either misremembered something which is possible or is is, is lying yeah and it, well, well i guess i guess again that's where i'd say so even you know the conjunctive probability of like temporal lobe syndrome uh hy hypoxia whatever all, in, all, in all these cases and the different combinations and the things we don't yet know about how the brain works all those things combined are still more probable than committing ghosts and things to my ontology how much research have you read about the relationship between oxygen level and reporting or not reporting a near-death experience af after resuscitation from cardiac arrest um, only what um, Carol Zaleski has collated together in her Zaleski wrote a book about ancient near-death experiences, um, but there's... She's there's, written several uh, books, not just that one. Well, there's actually research in which Zaleski. oxygen and carbon dioxide level were measured during resuscitation from cardiac arrest. <laughs> And what they found was no relationship between the levels of those gases in the blood and the um, likelihood that a person would or would not report a near-death experience. So in other words, you might have two people with high levels of oxygen in their blood during the whole episode, and one reports a near-death experience and the other doesn't, or two people with high carbon dioxide in their blood and one reports a near-death experience and one doesn't. So there's no relationship between blood gases. I mean, it it is so easy to sit and say this without knowing what research has been done. Yeah, it's very easy to say, you know, there's been this study which shows what you're saying is wrong, but um, Ernst A. Roden, a neurologist who scrutinizes his own near-death experience in an article in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases, The Reality of Death Experiences, A Personal Perspective, um, he attributes his near-death experience to hypoxia, even though it was one of the happiest moments of his life. Um, that, now, I'm not, right. I'm not attributing that's, all he cases has right to, to do hypoxia. That, but, but one, per, you, you know, that's one case is is not yeah I'm, but that's not what, value of yeah, but, the, a, but this a, isn't what i'm doing i'm saying we and we, neither we is one this. study either by the way studies need to be replicated more evidential than one case a study of several people is more evidential than yeah, but one what case. was your study that you you know you said this study exists that refutes you but that was that that's the level of it you didn't say who it, it was, was by Pim you didn't Vanilla, say what the sample size was was it Pim yeah uh, i can i can send you the reference if you want it but I can send you a reference back that's against your position. Like th this is the, the, the problem is if, if, if you have a false belief, a study, how would you find out? Do you mean a study in which numerous people were, their blood gases were measured during resuscitation from cardiac arrest and it showed a relationship between blood gas level and report of near-death experiences? I would like to see that study because I'm not aware that, that that's ever been the result of a study like that i'm trying to find but i think i think the the question is though that if if you did have a false belief on what's happening here how would you be find out are you trapped in a false belief if you have one because you said you know that this is true and you've said that because you're in this elect group of people who know that you couldn't be convinced out of it well i can't be convinced away from my my experience now you know one does going back to the guy who attributes his nde to hypoxia you know he has every right to do that 
Um, one doesn't subjectively experience hypoxia. So it's a, it's a deduction that he's made that, you know, he has every right to do. Um, but uh, it's different, you know, if, if I've been to Barcelona, Spain, and you're trying to tell me I haven't been there, sorry, you know, I've, I've just been there. I, I know. <laughs> Okay, so so do the interior angles of all triangles add up to 180 degrees? I don't know. I guess they do. I don't remember. Yeah, they, they do. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's not true because triangles on a curve, um, the con the concave side will have less than 180 degrees. The convex side will have more than 180 degrees. The point is, we can we can experience something and be wrong about it. We have to actually do empirical investigation into it to see what's actually going I on. I agree. Like I can. You know, like like I can see a bent stick in water, and it appears bent, but that doesn't mean that I'm actually seeing a bent stick. Mm -hmm. That's that's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. Okay, should we move on to the next episode? We've got yeah, fifteen we need minutes. To finish because I have to go in like ten. Sure, minutes. sure, not a problem. Okay, uh, just we'll have to do it very briefly then. Jan, do you want to do your um, review of episode five? For, I'll I'll do four and five together. Sure, it's five, um, be five and six. Um, five and six, that's it, five and six together. So five, I had a split reaction to. I really liked all the interviewing of Christopher Kerr and his study of, uh, he's a hospice physician who has studied the um, experiences of dying patients. And um, and it, I just, he, he I, in my view, did a good study um, good methodology and so forth, and um, and uh, he's uh, he's come away with the impressions that a lot of people have who do that work with that population of people, um, and um, and the most important thing there, I think, is that uh, many people who are terminally ill, not all, um, have experiences of things like perceiving deceased loved ones who seem to be appearing in order to accompany the dying person through the, the dying the death process, the physical death process into um, ongoing existence. And that uh, the vast majority of people are comforted by these experiences. So, um, there again, there always are exceptions. Um, occasionally, there are people who are distressed, but it's pretty rare. Um, so that uh, I like that. And then the other half of the of the episode four was more of the presenting um, anecdotal kinds of stuff that just didn't didn't appeal to me. Um, for number six. Um, the work of Jim Tucker following up on the work of Ian Stevenson. Um, those two researchers are among the people that I admire the most because they're, especially Ian Stevenson, I know um, I've read everything he wrote and he was quite adamant about not um, concluding that reincarnation is a fact. All he ever concluded was that everything he tried to do to find explanations, you know, physical material explanations for what was happening, which was children, for the most part children, um, remembering previous lives that involved specific names and events and uh, things like that with um, high levels of accuracy. Um, and, uh, and analyzing the, the frequency with which people tend to be accurate versus not. All he ever said was that he just had a boatload of cases that defied explanation uh, using material physical um, attempts to explain them. And so Jim Tucker has um, continued in that vein and, um, and they, uh, highlighted some cases that they've seen. And for anybody who really wants to delve into this topic, the single best thing I, can, I think you can get is the book 
called Where Reincarnation and Biology Intersect. And it's cases in which children are born with um, birthmarks, birth defects, and other physical manifestations that seem to relate to a traumatic death in a previous lifetime involving that um, thing. So somebody might have this dappled scarring, born with dappled scarring around their neck, and they recall a lifetime in which they hanged uh, to death, and they know the name of the person when it happened and all that, and then they go back to the, you know, newspapers and whatever records they can find and, um, and, and find that, uh, in fact, that a person, you know, with a, that name did die, die by hanging and so forth. So, um, um, and again, they look at uh, file drawer, confirmation bias, all the kinds of things that can misrepresent data uh, to ensure that that's not the case. So anyway, I thought they did a good job in um, episode six, representing Tucker's work, maybe not the strength of the research, the body of research that, that he has, uh, especially with building on Ian Stevenson's, but, um, but generally I thought a good, uh, that was a good episode. Right. Uh, okay. I'll do mine now. I'll have to really condense it down. Uh, so all I'll do with the uh, episode five, seeing dead people, is just say what uh, what would have improved it. Um, I think certainly uh, it was important to to note some of the facts that um, I can't remember his name, but the researcher did uh, comparing things like drug induced or dying brain induced hallucination and, and confusion versus these and and dreams as well versus these more much more lucid waking visions. So um, I think that was important because that will raise a few questions as to, well, maybe we should look in a bit more and see if we can find a better explanation than this. Uh, so what would have improved the evidential value of this episode? I put it at evidential value of five and entertainment value as five. Um, I think one phenomenon that really should have been included in this episode is terminal or paradoxical lucidity. Uh, mm. This is essentially, uh, if people don't know, this is essentially the strange occurrence in which somebody who's dying from a brain degenerative disease degenerative disease uh, but others such as alzheimer's um who is thus completely in incoherent towards the end of their lives suddenly regain complete awareness and complete clarity weeks to minutes before their actual death uh, despite the very connections of their brain being irreversibly broken down allegedly uh, i would also uh, have liked to see the inclusion of more veridical uh, cases again of deathbed vision such as those who see deceased people bef uh, those who see deceased people who were not known at that point to have died as of yet um, they could have also included some more footage from um, legitimate paranormal investigations, which they, they did at the start and had some reasonable um, reasonable hits, which could have been added evidential value, although we can't really say because we don't know the conditions that, um, that that came to be. We don't know if anyone was messing around behind the scenes adding it for evidential value. We don't know. Um, but if they could have added some footage for some more legitimate paranormal, paranormal investigations, for example, you know, not those ghost hunters or Derek Akora or whatever who are clearly bullshits for want of a better word um, not that I'm saying they are but they to me they clearly are uh, okay and on episode six I put the evidential value of this uh, for seven out of ten and the entertainment value as seven out of ten now I didn't manage to watch the whole episode of this because I had to I was planning on doing that today and then I had to shoot off something quite urgent took place that I had to be there for so um, all I'm going to do is outline one of the the cases that um, they talk about here, and as Jan said, Ian Stevenson's work and Jim Tucker's work are very important to uh, to read through before coming to any definite conclusions on the case on the reincarnation, because they are very landmark um, publications. So uh, we've shown a list of statements that um, the person, the boy Ryan, made about Marty, who was um, his previous life persona, so to speak. Um, which Jim then checked, Jim Tucker then checked by contacting Marty's still living daughter. And although the daughter does suggest that not all facts were accurate, uh, there were many that seemed to be very obscure. So I've put down a list of all the facts that um, that Ryan said about his previous life, Marty, that were confirmed to be um, legitimate and, and um, verifiable. Now, this doesn't mean that all the others 
that were listed were not true. It just means that they weren't able to be verified for whatever reason. So um, here's the list. Marty ran an agency, which was true. The agency changed people's names. Uh, he lived in a street that had rocks, R-O-C-K-S, in the name. Now, this is not completely correct, as the street was called Roxbury, R-O-X-B-U-R-Y. But rocks and rocks obviously sound the same, which could mean that he only recalled the sound of the name rather than the actual spelling of the street. Um, next, his mother had curly hair. That's not as impressive to me because many women do. I don't know about back in that day. Uh, he owned a green car. Uh, the daughter didn't know about this and said, no, that's not true, but it turns out that it was actually correct on further investigation. Um, he had many wives. He used to tap dance. The stage, I don't know which stage, uh, but the stage was in New York City. Uh, he ate in Chinatown a lot and had a favourite restaurant. Again, to me, not overly impressive. He had a younger sister. Again, this is another case where the daughter didn't know about this and therefore said it was false. But again, with further investigation, turned out to be true, much to, well, everybody's surprise, really. Uh, he bought his daughter a dog when she was around six years old and his daughter didn't like the dog. Uh, and he died at 61 years of age. This one's interesting because the official death certificate reads that um, Marty died at 59. But many other documents give dates that suggest he did in fact die at 61. And that's been confirmed again by the daughter as the actual truth. Um, overall, the researchers, including Jim, were able to verify 50 of Ryan's statements as accurate. Um, and as I said earlier, this doesn't suggest that the other statements that were not correct or that were not verified were not correct. It just means that they were unable to be verified by the researchers. So they may or may not have been correct. We just don't know. Okay, that's that's my review of that. Uh, Nathan, over to you, buddy. I'll keep it as quick as possible. Um, the Seeing Dead People episode, I, I can't remember everything of these because I didn't take notes and watch them a couple of weeks ago now, but the Seeing Dead People episode, two things stick in my memory, um, one of which was the photographs. And um, I remember they could only take the photographs on this particular kind of camera. Um, and my girlfriend had a theory as well about the writing of the words that because there were Polaroids of that kind that um, you could like etch in the back while the photo was being formed some of the, the words. And so I think we're actually going to buy one of those cameras and see if we can replicate what was going on there. Um, and then the other thing was with the, vo the voice recording of the ghost hunters, um, where I remember thinking... Um, for example, they'll do things like run taps and record the noise, and then they'll listen back to it and hear kind of like um, a distortion in the audio and say, you know, it'll be like, oh, yes, uh, my name is Dirt or whatever. And um, I think that this is another interesting feature of um, human psychology that we can see in play where it's like kind of if you if you stare at static long enough, you start kind of trying to make sense of it and re read patterns into it and things. Um, and that was kind of weird. But again, I, I don't know a whole lot about um, the actual research and stuff that's gone on behind these. I'd, ha I'd have to look more into it to be able to give any kind of informed opinion on it. And basically the same for the reincarnation one. Like I found it very weird. Um, I definitely felt um, sorry for the guy who was um, reincarnated because I think he felt even if the reincarnation is tr true, um, he obviously felt like he didn't have these memories anymore as an adult, and he sort of had to like perform or act up to the expectation placed on him, and it seemed kind of unfortunate. And um, so, so that 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 was, that was a bit kind of um, weird for him. But I, I mean, I, I had had some views of some of the things he was saying, like when he said, you know, like um, when he went to. I forget where it was, if it was, if it was LA or, or wherever. And he was like, I fe felt like I was coming home and um, like, like I'm adopted, for example. And like when I went to where um, I, w I was born biologically, I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm coming home. But it's really just because I created this expectation story in my childhood about, um, you know, like where, where I'm from or whatever. And now I've kind of like figured out that most of that was sort of like a wish fulfillment thing that I'd created that I, I don't feel like that when I go to those areas. So I, th I think the human brain is capable of doing those types of things on its own, but I can't say that that's what's going on in this case. Um, and I, and definitely there's a lot of cases of um, these reincarnations. Um, I think as the documentary said, it seems to be more prevalent in um, cultures that are accepting of reincarnation as like the, the primary religion. And I'd have to look into it more to have any kind of even, um, can't even think, can't think of words today. It's been a long day. Opinion. Um, yeah, well, I'm thinking of like small, but small isn't the right predicate to give to it. So something opinion, like a, to have a, a well-informed opinion of some kind, um, absolutely butchered it at the end, but there we go. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, okay. I, don't, I don't have a strongly informed opinion on, on sure. this one. We know what you mean. Okay, thanks. Uh, Aaron? Okay, 
um episode what are we we're episode five, five and six, six. Five and six. Five and six. Um, the paranormal investigation one, I I didn't find that compelling or entertaining. Um, I, when it got to the point where they were doing the sound audio, I I was aware of that. I was aware of the um, what do you call it? When somebody when you hear a word and then somebody tells you what it says, like you'll hear it. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's paranormal or if it's um. Regardless, I, so when they did the the audio, I was listening. I had it on subtitles, and I made sure to close my eyes when I knew that the voice recording was coming up, and uh, without being prompted with the with the with what they told me what it said, and with the captioning, I didn't hear that. I just thought what I heard. So um, that was kind of like interesting for me to kind of participate in that experiment. Um, I felt like the uh, episode five was particularly bad at. Um, at the a straw man to the skept skeptics but then again here i am right now like fulfilling that uh, a little bit because i did find it to be probably the worst out of the series for um, compelling information um the thing i like the most about the last two episodes what i actually like, really like the portrait artist i thought that was really interesting i was a little disappointed that they didn't show a side by side uh with the with the lady's husband when she claimed you know that the picture was of her of her dead spouse um another thing that just came up again for me with that episode was just the kind of the inconsistency about um the claims made about these afterlife experiences whether it's good or bad reincarnation seems to be a kind of throw a wrench into what people report from the medium experiences um as far as whether people are happy and that sort of thing on the other side i don't know if that's important or not as far as the claims go um and what other night i wrote i wrote a bunch of stuff down but most of it you guys have kind of talked about it already um the reincarnation video was was probably the hardest one to watch because i did feel like the people the children who had gone through that seemed a lot more distressed than anyone else on the, in the whole series so um I, I thought some of those claims were weird. I, I didn't think they gave a lot of evidence for why um, why it was compelling. Like, yeah, I could see that if they line up the information, that is certainly bizarre, but they didn't give much information behind that about um, how to eliminate uh, external influence from the parents and that sort of thing. And the reincarnation episode with James three, I found really interesting, um, but not um, not very compelling. And and looking up the that they have a book, and I looked at some of the reviews and stuff, and it seemed like there was a lot of external motivation from the mom. Um, so that that whole episode, I just I didn't really enjoy it all that much. But I think that's about it um, for me. Maybe more will come up when we open discuss. Sure. Uh, well, Jan's had to shoot off now. She's had uh, some other engagement. So, yeah, reasonable. Um, I'd like to ask him, um, Nathan, what's your opinions on the 50 verified facts about the, the guy Marty, whatever? <laughs> I just don't know enough about them to really be able to say. Um, I, th I think they're weird for sure. Like, definitely they're weird. And um, I'd have to look into the specifics of what's going on there in that sure. entire case to really be able to piece together what I think is going on. But yeah, it's like it, it it's uh it because i don't know enough about it it's not enough to like um overcome all of these other beliefs that i have that say that that sort of thing can't happen but for sure i could like look into it and it's like yeah this i need to revise my beliefs in some in some place or maybe it'll turn out that there's like some sequence of natural things going on that uh, explain to me why that's happening that don't you know cause me to revise those foundational beliefs so i i don't have an explanation at the moment mm -hmm. yeah sure anybody else want to mention anything autumn um i i did find the stories about the children who had accurate information about somebody else's life to be interesting um con i wouldn't say like i'm fully convinced that people can reincarnate but i definitely thought those were fascinating stories C kind of to echo echo what nathan's saying i would just have to look more into it to form an opinion on it um because especially and I think too, it's like, this could be my bias towards like cute little children. Like I, like I want to 
you know, believe them and support them. And like, cause I've always worked with small kids as a career choice. So watching the little boy, um, talk about his past life and pick out, um, five out of five accurate pictures of, of his previous life, um, as claimed was, I would say like, to me, the, the most powerful thing I saw in the whole series. And that could be just like my bias of wanting to believe a cute little kid. I don't know. But um, uh, I guess I would wonder if he was given more than just five pictures, if what else he would be able to know about that other person's mm. life that he supposedly lived. Do you think it's it's quite significant, though, that he did get five out of five on those pictures? And he, he's apparently he did it, if, if I'm thinking of the same kid, immediately with no hesitation. It wasn't just that he got five out of five pictures. It was like watching how confident he was in picking yeah. them. He didn't seem to like hesitate or mull it over. He was very confident that like he had another life. Those were his parents. That's the park that he played in. Uh, that was his house. And so watching him and like how young he is, like unless, you know, his mom's some like grade A acting coach, which, you know, would be like crazy um i don't yeah i don't really have an alternative explanation for that i don't think okay erin um you, you mentioned that um and it's true certainly and i agree that we don't know the background of how much information maybe the parents gave with these details um how do you think that's relevant to the 50 facts that were lift, listed off and uh, as well another point that's i suppose it's important for people to know about that case is that um, they mentioned that uh, this guy Marty, whatever, and his he was a an extra in a film that was there's virtually no information online about this film or who was in it. Um, that's what they said anyway. And his friend George, who also starred in that, um, so it's very it seems very unlikely that unless the the parents knew of this film and knew of everybody in it, they couldn't have possibly well they, they could have done, but they have to be very lucky to come across it online and they had to do really mm -hmm. rigorous research into it to find them. Uh, what would you say um, that the fifty facts? How does that fall into that i don't area. know i think I, I found that case much more interesting and um thought provoking and i would actually want to like look into that further um found that case study a lot more interesting than um the james three one um oh, james i don't know mm. i i definitely i would say that 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 um deserves more inquiry uh because that's pretty pretty fascinating that he would be able to do that yeah i'm curious what, what do you think is the um the inconsistencies, inconsistencies between uh, like the episodes on mediumship and the idea of the afterlife from there and reincarnation. Um, the inconsistencies um, for me would be that like the the mediumships in particular and the after uh, what did they call them when after like they communication. They, after death communication they seem to all be positive. Um, they're and I'm I'm not sure I I haven't I didn't see any evidence that anybody comes back and says anything negative or like something like like people surely there are people who have tension in their relationships and then someone passes unexpectedly and um you know yeah. the that they their loved one would maybe come through and say like actually I I am mad at you still <laughs> um so I felt like that was just somewhat inconsistent uh with real life I guess um. So the, the fact that the messages was always received exactly what the seeker was hoping to hear. Um, so that's neither here nor there, but then you, you compare that to the NDE experiences and then like the uh, crisis apparitions and the reincarnation, I feel like all would imply that the this experience afterwards is not very pleasant. Um, How so so I overall, I would question like what what is the point what is the thing that is so important coming through here is it just that there's consciousness after death um is it that because it seems like some messages come through that it, it, they want the people to know that there is peace afterwards um and it seemed to be very like reliant on what the seeker was looking for already does that make sense it does although I'll, I'll, you'll have to forgive me because i didn't see the end of the um reincarnation cases i had to get called away quite urgently so what what was the case in there that assumed it was negative after 
um just the in the reincarnation one it was the this idea that like these people passed but then they they were upset about passing and that they um in so much that they would come and kind of intrude on someone else's life and cause a burden on them to you know fulfill these desires that they weren't able to fulfill um and just even the idea that they would choose to come back um after death would imply to me that if there's if this all was proven true that it's obviously not um it's not the peaceful, um, yeah. happy existence that is comes across in the mediumship episodes. So that was mm-hmm. just a little bizarre for me. I don't know if I'd interpret that to mean that the afterlife wasn't good enough to um, to stay. I'd say that that's, that, to me, at least would imply that they just weren't happy with the fact that they had to go that early or that soon or at that moment in time. And so they instantly wanted to come back to do what they didn't do. I don't think it sounds like they probably, I mean, I don't know what the hell time is like over there. I can't imagine, but they didn't stay there long enough. Really... Yeah, I just find it interesting that in medium, in the mediumship episodes, none of the people that, you know, came through would say, like, I'm really upset that I'm dead. And um, I want to come back and just, you know, wait, I'm going to come back in, you know, there's this baby due in a few weeks, I'm going to try to come back through them. Like, you don't, those, they don't seem to correlate with each other, those different mm different yeah, ideas of it yeah and it, yeah. this is all goes to kind of philosophize about what that state is like and what our experiences are after that and i think as you said earlier the main purpose of these episodes is to show that there is something here that seems to suggest whatever the hell it may be or whatever the yeah. hell it may imply there is something going on that warrants further investigation that may suggest that the brain is not the producer of consciousness what, what yeah what that life is like after death i mean first of all it's not going to be in space or time apparently according to many anecdotal cases of it and um, so that experience alone you, you know how could you imagine that so whatever we feel uh, about that one other comment that i would make about this is like um there there's also seems to be an underlying assumption that everyone needs to know that there is a some sort of eternal uh, component to your consciousness that lives on forever and that without that that there is this inevitable inevitability to you know succumb to nihilism or depression or hopelessness and meaninglessness and um and so i i do see like that that's that is a pretty strong presumption um within these cases and within these stories um so that's why i've asked since the beginning it was like why why is it important what is the message that they're coming trying to get across and what about people who would find this actually quite distressing that life like some people i know a lot of people especially in the um agnostic and atheist and skeptic community where like they don't have desire for eternal eternal consciousness or a life afterwards so um you know the motivation mm. to look into this further is like they don't care mm. um or alternatively like this would be an unwelcome kind of thing like it's so yeah. there there is an assumption it, it sort of cut for me came across similarly to like how i would say like a christian would say like <laughs> you know we have this great news of eternal life and some people will, will be like well i don't really i'm not really interested in that so i did see a lot of kind of unfortunate parallels um with you know faith proselytization and and this idea but same yeah mm-hmm. i would yeah <clears throat> okay so um the idea if i'm getting you right Aaron, that um we must believe in this to have value otherwise you don't have value yeah i think if we could drop that part of the message i'd be yeah I like think... not you sorry but like just the i would feel more compelled to look into this more if it didn't seem like they always came with us underlying message like that this is an this is a existential you know threat to your hopeless your hope your meaning um in life like if it, if we could just look at it a little bit more um objectively and be like it'd be really interesting to find out that some part of us you know um mm-hmm. exists externally um but i didn't i don't like the and this probably is because i'm you know i i apostatized from my faith i don't like the added messages along with it um that yeah. now this is now this is how you are ought to live because yeah. of knowing this information i feel like that's unnecessary yeah. I, I get what mm-hmm. you mean and that shouldn't be the the persuading factor to look into it because it's, no. it's already true and you must believe it it should be the data that comes from these yeah these exactly and, and, data... and a lot of sorry oh sorry a bit of delay here um i did feel like when i did look into this further there was um there was a lot of things put out and even by i looked up jan's um ian's uh i don't want to say what's the not company organization, organization yeah. and there was a lot of um 
attributing what different motivations to people who don't believe what that I just totally did not connect with. Like when they, you know, they, they will often say people don't want to know and they, people, it's actually just um, driven by fear. And it's, it's, I'm like, that's just yeah. so not true. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say <laughs> I, that. I think mo the, the most reason or the, the main reason that people disbelieve this sort of thing is because lack of, of, of knowledge of the, of the, of the data. I mean, you know, the majority, I'm not saying this for everyone, but the majority of people that I've spoken to who say, I don't believe in this sort of thing, and are you know vocal against it i say well how far have you looked into the research and they say oh I've, I've heard about some ndes and i've seen it on this steven novella's site or whatever and i think okay well you've never read that have you ever read this no have yeah you, have you ever and i looked would... at bruce grayson who's that oh you know yeah, yeah but, it's quite, but, so but it's quite some people just really don't care oh now they we really all don't. want to talk go ahead yeah. on. i'm out <laughs> sorry just just to echo what aaron was saying even there i'm reminded of what apologists will say because First, Christians will move. So this is like a moving of the goalpost thing, or that's how it looks. And I'm not saying you're doing you're doing that on purpose, Darren, but that's how it looks to somebody who's come out of a, a faith belief and to a point of skepticism. Um, is that oh, like Christians will say, oh, atheists just haven't read the Bible, and if they read the Bible, then they would believe. And then atheists say, okay, and then they do read the Bible and they criticize things within the Bible, and then the goalpost is moved, um, and it's like, oh, well, you haven't heard these um extra biblical arguments for god from philosophy or you haven't read this particular academic book and it, and then and then skeptics will, will go okay yeah we'll we'll do that we'll we'll debate against your argument your philosophical arguments or we'll read your academic book and then we um have questions from our skepticism and then the goalpost is moved again well nothing will convince you then i don't think it, this has to do with with to the christian it has to do with the atheist's quote unquote heart or soul and maybe to to someone who believes um in reincarnation it could be just well you're just going to be skeptical no matter what and it's it, it's it's easier to criticize the skeptical point of view than to like keep refuting the skeptical questions i guess well now all, all i'm saying is if, if you're skeptical of near-death experiences for instance and you're skeptical um regardless of never having looked at the actual data i'm not talking about you know it's completely different to christianity because you know the bible doesn't have any empirical facts behind it you know it's all based on historical evidence which um i was had a chat with gary habermas recently who, who believes that the um resurrection took place because of this historical uh, evidence and other scholars in in the field of what they've said but what i'm saying here is you can't have an opinion definitely one way or the other on a phenomena unless you look at the people and the research that has been done on the phenomena and you know the difference is, is that this is now you know in the realms of, of science of observable observed recorded repeat well we can say repeated in some but it's, you know it's common amongst many experiences and this is data so if you're going to tell me that you're um that you believe i'm wrong or that you believe something else but you've never actually looked at the data and, and you know if you for instance don't know who bruce grayson is instantly i can tell you've never you haven't dug far enough into that because that's the first name you'll ever come across is bruce grayson yeah and i'm not saying that we like can refute you without having looked into the evidence of course a, a good skeptic is going to look into the evidence um i'm just saying that in the language in the language in the show it was very reminiscent of how apologists will say like there are just some skeptics that will never be there's t some certain group of atheists that will just never be convinced and i'm only trying to work on the ones who can and that it's just that language is very similar to me mm. is so, all i'm so saying when you said then that um my arguments are, are, are similar to moving the goalposts in in Christianity and things like that. What do you mean? No, I'm not saying that you in particular. You, you said I'm not doing it are, willingly necessarily, but. No, I'm just saying I'm reminded of it seems similar to me. And like it, it, Jan's not here to defend herself, but as an example, the way that she framed her three categories of people was again unfair to me because she said there's the people who have had the experience yeah. who you can quote unquote armchair philosophize and try to debunk mm -hmm. 
or there's the people who are who will remain skeptics no matter what amount of evidence they're shown they won't change their mind she changed the language depending on the group so when one group is criticized it's armchair philosophy and when the skeptic group is criticized they're they're dismissing actual evidence and to me that that framing is rem reminiscent of a, of an apologist they'll, they'll have the yeah. same framing in how they talk about skeptics right. I, I think what she's saying there is i think and not not criticizing but understandably i think you're looking a bit too far into what she's saying because i think she's doing is describing three types of people uh, on one side you've got people that have experienced these things and know i wouldn't say they know it but they know it to be true and they won't be swayed by armchair philosophy or any other kind of argument against them they won't but why didn't them. she say evidence why wouldn't she say they won't be convinced no matter what evidence has shown them to that's contrary to their experience why did she change one group was given the word armchair philosophy and the skeptic group was given the term evidence and that to me is framing and that is unfair well, and I, that's I, not I, just that I, that isn't just in this video too like i did i did um like quite a bit of looking into the ions foundation and like they they their wording that's why i said what what is the importance of your language that you use because see it does seem like they they, these words aren't accidental they do they do tend to repeat the same verbiage um repeat like consistently in their videos so like the difference between belief and knowledge and the difference between like what adam's saying like um armchair philosophizers versus you know people who've looked at the the evidence they they will repeat the word facts often like there is a lot of that repetitive okay. language that i think so, is not just a one-off that autumn picked up on okay so if jan had said so you've got these people that believe or that believe that they know because they've had these experiences and no evidence to the contrary will sway them would that seem better I think that if you that it would be less dogmatic to use the same terms for both groups. So the group that believes no amount of evidence would dissuade them, and the group that doesn't believe, um, t in her opinion, no amount of evidence would sway them. Um, I am a skeptic, and I would say that I can be swayed by good evidence. That I mean, yeah, I I was swayed by evidence contrary to. A, a belief that I held for over two decades. Yeah. So I, I think I can change my mind when given evidence that's contradictory to what I believe. Yeah, but let, let's not get hung up on the way Jan phrases it because I can tell you yeah. what she means is, you know, she, she means exactly what you're saying, that they won't be swayed by, even if, if there is reasonable evidence, she's saying that's not necessarily a, well, I wouldn't say that she's saying, but in my opinion, it's not necessarily a good thing to believe and not be swayed by armchair philosophizing or evidence in the, to, to the contrary. And then on the other side, you've got those who won't be swayed by evidence on the contrary on the other side. You know, those that just, I won't believe it no matter how much evidence I'm given. That's the same for both sides. It's just one's positive, one's negative or whatever. Do you think, do you think Darren, that like there's a bit of like a, a false dichotomy or a false dilemma going on at all throughout this? It's like that you either, you either believe or you don't believe. Do you think that it's possible to have a sliding scale of confidence? Because like, I wouldn't put myself as, as, um, 100% confident that there's nothing immaterial about the mind or that you know but I wouldn't I would still put my confidence level well below 50% on that um yeah. and like I, I I see that as a as a good way of going forward and like I could even put a number value on it and be like you know after watching the series like I it maybe took my confidence that something immaterial from like a 5% to like a 10% <laughs> But it didn't overall change. I'm not going to go and change my whole um, paradigm of my world view and everything like that based on it. Um, what do you think about that? I think looking at these subjects, black and white, either I believe fully or I disbelieve fully is foolish because then mm -hmm. you, you stop doing science and you're convinced on a position that we don't know. I'm yeah. from my position. If you were to ask me, do you believe that life continues after the death of the physical body in some way? I'd say I'm at 70 percent. Yes. And is there anything that would increase your confidence or decrease your confidence in that? If you could show me um, evidence that the brain produces consciousness, um, then that doesn't correspond to other ideas, you know, so evidence that only goes for the brain creating consciousness, I would then look at it and reconsider. Um, it, in terms of what's uh, what would convince me more I'd, I'd like to see experiments like the Sam Panier one the aware study in contr controlled conditions where they have seen a target I mean in the Sam Panier experiment there was a case of um, 
a veridical out body perception. It's just it just wasn't off the target, so people think it's irrelevant, which it's not. It's still a veridical perception in a time when it shouldn't have been possible. Um, but they mm. like to say because it's not of the target, it's irrelevant, which blows my mind because I don't understand that idea. But you know, yeah, see, I would just agree with that. I don't think it's irrelevant. I just don't think that it's. Um, I, I wouldn't. I, I would need more than that to like overcome my, you know, my bias, I guess I would still be, that wouldn't put me over 50%, but yeah, mm. I think that's a good position to have, to not be dogmatic about it and say that like, you know, my confidence level in this being true or not could go up or down based on, you know, incoming information. Mm. So, and I mean, I, I, I would still say that I sit in that, I still hasn't quite moved me up the scale um, that much yet. So. Mm. Anything I, I think um I, I have something a few things to say on um I think I do think um that the non-neutral language that Jan used even if it wasn't deliberate was revealing of the way that she thinks about the world as like an in-group out group us versus them kind of thing and I think that the irony of the non-neutral language that she was using was that um she said the skeptics won't be shifted no matter what the evidence says but she put herself in a group that because she has special knowledge cannot be shifted and she seemed to um hint at that because we if we had those kinds of experiences then we you know we would be shifted and it's just because of some kind of ignorance on our behalf but she had also didn't ask you know whether we'd had near-death experiences or anything like this like for example um i think i would firmly be someone who's put in that camp of being you know unconvincible skeptic based off of the conversation I've had with her but she doesn't know that I've had like 17 experiences on psilocybin mushrooms which have blown my mind and like made me think yeah like what the hell's going on with consciousness or that like a year ago I was like a metaphysical idealist and thought that reductionism was completely stupid and it's only through further study that I've then moved towards those beliefs but instead the assumption is always on on bad faith and that was what um I, I don't know like like I, again, I've got an explanation that accounts for all of this, and it's just human cognitive biases and heuristics forming in-group, out-group beliefs, and, you know, like, um, I think that that's what's going on in all, all these cases. But I'd frame it, like, I'm doing that same thing as well, like, we're all, I, I'd say we're, we're all doing that to a degree, and, and that, I think that's the difference. I'm not saying, like, you know, um, naturalism has revealed it to me, so I know, but these people just won't be convinced of the truth because of their moral error or whatever, which... Well, I mean, what she's saying is it's story. those that have had experiences are you know are much more believing that they that it was true than those that haven't yeah you know what what that means for for mushrooms and ketamine and whatever we don't know i mean we don't know how those drugs work i would argue that um they we do though somewhat we do have a lot we of information create, about we know they create the experiences yeah a well, little at bit least as much as we do for ndes yeah yeah well we yeah. know that we, um, we know yeah. for instance that from one of the most recent studies that ketamine reduces the activity in a part of the brain called the what was did you tell me nathan the default yeah. mode not, this is psilocy psilocybin in the default mode yeah. network yeah. and yeah. studies rebus and the anarchic brain by robin carter yeah so what would that suggest to you that the, that, that part of the brain shutting down is creating hallucination no, well so so that um bit of architecture in the brain is sort of associated with um like distinguishing between um for example like like the, the self and other stuff um, and also coordinating like um, sensory perception. So um, when when you see that area become downregulated, people then begin to report like seeing faces in like you know like in wood grain and stuff like that, which is which fits with like the explanation that's being offered, which is that what this thing normally does is it kind of like has the, there's this perception coming in, it's sort of looking for patterns and figuring out you know like say if there's if there's audio noises, did I hear Nathan in that? Did I you know like it and and that bit gets downregulated and then you start hearing like what the sound is actually like in and of itself rather than like the way you want to shape it to make sense of the world kind of thing right. um and, and there's loads of little things like that going on in mm -hmm. the like actually um so so people like rupert sheldrake will want to say well when um because there's less activity in the brain but people have this enhanced conscious experience this is evidence that consciousness isn't part of the brain um and and we but we we see um all sorts of things going on like there is um, in enhanced um, interconnectivity between the left and right hemispheres, for example. Um, I don't have a full explanation of what's going on, just like, like with NDEs, but there, there is some pretty interesting um, research going on around it. Um, yeah, yeah we, we touched very briefly um, on a subject that should have been included, I think, in the series, which is terminal lucidity. I don't know, do you know anything about that? 
Not too much now. No, a okay. little bit. No. My my mom's actually a volunteer at a hospice, and I've watched uh, several people pass, and I've I've experienced that somewhat. Not like um as a not a first person, obviously, but no, yeah. So just well, what what do you think about that sort of thing then? Um, <laughs> based on zero research, I would say um, that there's this final. This is going to be my hypothesis, right before you pass that like there's this final surge of kind of um energy I, and i i have seen that before when mm. i have i watched a few people pass away and they did seem inc incredibly lucid at the very end and then they were gone mm. i've also i okay i don't want to dehumanize but like i've also watched my pets <laughs> go from being very lethargic mm. and and um you know thinking they were going to pass and then they have on their last day they they act like a kitten again and like there's just weird things i think the body does as mm -hmm. it's passing and weird um ex like expellation of different energies and things yeah. as like one final gusto and i think mm. that that's could be similar what's going on with the brain so i'd, I'd be curious you know? i'd be curious to ask them what, what do you think then of the cases of terminal lucidity that take place at the end of a brain degenerative disease where all the connections are broken down you know beyond i don't know brain. yeah i'm not sure i don't i i i'm not a neuroscientist i don't sure, sure. i will admit ignorance to the research there yeah. um and and honestly i i even though i had experienced it as a as a somebody who is with somebody i it's it didn't really even mm. um inspire me to like research into it more i just was like well that was kind of neat and kind of nice for us as a, a family member to have that yeah. final few moments with them and then they were gone sure okay mm -hmm. and uh, nathan you said you had a, a reasonable physical explanation or natural whatever you want to say we, we mean physical explanation to uh, all the cases of ndes that we mentioned uh, due to new, um what did you well, call not it? not one sorry but like I, I'm saying, like the, it, it seems to me that um, the the money, as it were, is on the side of a natural explanation, but okay. we don't have a complete one. And you, some combination yeah. of some of these things seems to explain a lot of these cases. Mm -hmm. um, now there could be, you know, like like I said, because I'm not a, an expert in this area, there could be like one or two cases that actually lie outside this, and maybe you'd only need one really, really good qualitative case to like disprove this. But um, of all the ones I've so far looked into, I've generally found like um, there's there's just like a bunch of stuff going on um, that makes the sort of counter explanation implausible to me. Of the ones I've looked into, this doesn't mean there isn't one out there that is different. To that. So how, how would you argue if um, if you're given say um, one of the, and according to Bruce Grayson, uh, uh, do you say tens or hundreds of thousands, but th a lot, thousands of, of cases where we know that, or we can reasonably assume from current neuro neuroscience that any kind of bias or whatever other cognitive dissonances can't take place because these um, veridical perceptions have taken place while the brain was not working, or at least the cortex was not working, which would be needed to form any form of consciousness by our current neuroscientific standpoint. And apparently there are thousands of these. So how, how would you respond when faced with something like that? Yeah, I, I genuinely, I, I don't know. I mean, um, fair enough. Yeah. We, we, we don't know what the neural correlates of consciousness are. I mean, um, there are parts of the nervous system that are reflexive. There are, you know, there's a central nervous system, there's stuff going on in the gut, there's the limbic system, you know, like a, an EEG might not measure what's going on in the, the limbic system or these other mm. areas. Um, in some of the cases that I've looked into, it seems possible that someone started having like an OBE and then um, anesthetic kicked in and then there's like surgical procedure later. And then when the story is recounted and retold, it's not really clear what the chronology is in the timeline. So they could be reporting these memories from an OBE that kind of like started hours before an operation and then during the operation you, you can't actually verify that the memories are during that time. For example, it's, well, A lot of these cases I are really, really difficult and there's lots going on. I had written something down similar to that, Nathan, but not as clear <laughs> that like there's a sense of there's this reported sense of timelessness. Um, but then when people come back, they do have a different like a chronology, but there's really no way to know whether that experience happened in that few moments that their brain was kind of going offline and then online again. Um, there, there is. Oh, okay. <laughs> a, a lot of these recorded instances, like the ones in the um, the self does not die, the events that the people witnessed like um say the pan Reynolds case for example but she heard a, a a snippet of um what was the song hotel california and that song and the bit that she recalled hearing was playing um while with pan Reynolds, her brain was, i mean there was so much information that was missing from in this series about the pan Reynolds case but effectively her brain was uh, drained her 
body was <laughs> effectively frozen and she had uh, clicks playing in her ear what or clicks in one ear white noise in another at 100 decibels which is like standing outside next to someone with a jackhammer and that was done to measure her brainstem activity to make sure she was still you know alive at some age but the, all, all the other brain all the cortex and all that was completely shut down and was not working registering flat on the eeg and when that song was played over the radio or at least the part of it that she recalled her brain was was still measured up to these equipment and it was shown to be flat so that's how you can tell we know that that perception if it took place must have been while her brain was down because that's when the music was playing but then like but nathan nathan brought up the part about the neural correlates with like consciousness and like involving other areas of the body as well and the gut and all these other different things so like yeah true. would that maybe necessarily prove that consciousness maybe just isn't coming directly from your like your brain area and there's other areas in the body that have to do with consciousness consciousness as well not really uh, because we, we know no? we know what level of reading is necessary on an eeg machine to correlate with consciousness we know that once a certain uh, activity threshold is is reached on that eeg that consciousness is gone and that would be, you know, if that was the case, then we could expect, I'd imagine, during anesthesia, or at least, you know, or even just being whacked on the head. You know, we wouldn't expect necessarily to completely lose consciousness there if, if it comes from all over the body, just from damage to the head. You know, things like that. That is interesting. Yeah. I've been under anesthetic so many times. I've had surgeries. I've had not near death, um, ap not an experience, but an episode. Yeah. I've had a near death. I've had two different near death episodes. I've done psilocybin i've had out of body experience of astral projected i've lucid dreamed um but i still find myself on the under 50 percent mm. you know convinced mm. that um, jealous so. i haven't had any of those experiences yeah. <laughs> it's been a wild life autumn it's been yeah. wild <laughs> let's bring up another interesting thing about anesthesia is is why if consciousness is separate from the brain why does anesthesia have an effect at all because you'd imagine that consciousness would be but i think yeah. i think the thing is you know, a lot of these anesthetics, I mean, A, the um, consciousness where it would still be somewhat connected to the brain. I mean, we know that um, these neural correlates that the brain has something very, very close to do with consciousness and the mind. Um, because it's correlational, we can't say that it produces it or that it filters it or that it does some other weird shit that we don't even begin to understand. Um, but when, when we're given anesthetics, you know, these drugs have huge, hugely amnesic properties to them. So how do we know that during anesthesia and there is a quantum catch trap there has been studies done that show that we are conscious during anesthesia and deep sleep but that the memory of that because of the amnesic effect of of, um, of the anesthetic i don't know about deep sleep but because of the anesthetic um, amnesic properties that we just you know the memory isn't recalled so it's interesting to think how do you know that during anesthesia you are aware but you don't record the memory and therefore don't remember it because the experience would be the same wouldn't it I missed that last part. How do we know what that? So how, how do we know that? Um, how do we know whether anesthesia removes consciousness completely, or that it, oh, okay. it doesn't, but it just prevents us the memory from being saved because the experience of both would be the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm. I, I'm not sure exactly how you'd test it. Um, you'd have it, but this. But this is the problem with competing explanations because you 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 need an an explanation that makes some predictions, and then you can try and falsify those predictions, and that that is part of my criticism of some of the these like f firstly it's not it's not clear to me because like like you said um whatever we find out is the explanation of these things that will be subsumed into like natural causal reality in some sense um so then it's not clear to me why this becomes like um well clearly like um people who are looking for an explanation of this through this through like trying to find out what's going on in the brain or whatever they're like wrong or misguided to do so because surely that would be the right track but that but then there is also this thing of it's not at all clear to me and even speaking to you know the expert janice what what the actual alternative explanation is and um if if we have an alternative explanation then we should be able to make some predictions based off of it like um you know cartesian dualism it well well if that's the case then it shouldn't be that when we separate the corpus colossum that um we we have two kind of um different hemispheres of conscious experience mm -hmm. potentially happening and th like things like that we should be able to make predictions based off of whatever our theory is mm -hmm. and I, i'm not sure whether that's been done or not um if you listen to yeah. inspiring philosophy apparently there have been future testable predictions made about the neuroscience if the theory is that it produces consciousness that have been falsified i don't know it depends what kind of 
what outlook you have and then how do you how do you make predictions on that i don't know but hopefully you know that sort of thing will take place eeg doesn't necessarily correlate with behavior says Danesh no but eeg does correlate with whether we're conscious or not you know if, if eeg levels go down to a certain level then you're not conscious that's what that's what we see yeah. I, I, again, I don't know enough about it, but, th but wouldn't this be a counterexample, though? So let's say if there are people who are flat, flatline EEGs but have a conscious experience, then wouldn't that mean that EEG doesn't actually, you know, do that? Even if it's this wit, like distorted kind of OBE experience, it would mean there's there's something going on that we should investigate. And that, I, like, I'm just not prepared to sort of jump on an explanation because I don't know exact. I don't know enough about what's going on, what the well, ins instruments are involved, what the then, limits then are. Then you're undermining all neuroscientific research done on EEG that's shown these correlations. Maybe, maybe I don't, I, like I'm saying, I don't know. I, I don't know enough about it. I mean, yeah. like when I was taught, when I was speaking, so James has just finished his master's in neuroscience and I've, I've got an offer to do computational neuroscience next year. Maybe I'll do that or philosophy instead. Um, and maybe one day I'll be informed enough to know what the hell's going on with these instruments and things, but I just don't know what their, you know, like what their tolerance is, what, what their fault rates are, what you, like, I, I have no idea, but, but also in the case of, of Pam Reynolds, it doesn't seem that we can actually align the times that she had EEG on with the times when she may have potentially had her out of body experience as well, um, we can because she heard the music at the time that the EG was flat. I would need to read the surgeon's reports, but I've not yeah, come across but, that um, stuff yet. Yeah, yeah, you'd have to if you get in contact with. Well, I'll send you an email to a bloke who's who's Again, done all the medical. Yeah, sure. Kim's saying no. I mean, I, I don't know exactly if uh, EEG correlates with consciousness, but everything every literature i've ever read on it says that it does a team was able to demonstrate using rats that eeg doesn't always track with being awake the study raises question about what it means to be conscious okay well fair enough then if that's the case but you know from what i've, I've everybody i've spoken to and everything i've read if eeg gets below a certain level consciousness is not possible because it, it's you know it's neuro um, cortical activity i don't know exactly but if that's the case then fair enough i'll have to have a look into it but again you know this is rats we don't know the differences between the physiology of the rat and the physiology of the human but there's a lot at stake uh, or a lot to be considered anyway okay so i think we'll, we'll end it there thanks mm -hmm. uh, thanks everyone for coming it's a shame jan had to jump off earlier but never mind yeah thanks for having us on thanks very much yeah, thanks thank you for to watch. We appreciate your time and uh, we'll see you next time if we all get together again yes bye-bye bye bye, bye. bye.